free Scaro! Hello, everyone. Welcome to Radio Free Scarrow, episode number 895. I am Stephen in Edmonton. Morning, Vancouver. And Chris in Edmonton. Uh, big episode today for the old podcast. Uh, Chris Chibnall, uh, the outgoing, uh, as we joke about, the, the former, the, the unemployed showrunner uh, of, of Doctor Who, is on this very podcast, folks, recorded last week at Gallifrey One. Uh, a whole He gave us a whole hour and a half of his time for this, uh, some of which was spent uh, of him videoing a, a massive lineup to get in to see Jodie Whittaker in the autograph battle, which he wanted to, <laughs> to record mm-hmm. on his phone, um, which we allowed him because it, uh, it was fun. Uh, <laughs> he's a nice chap. He's a very nice chap. Yes, we allowed him. Oh, yeah, yeah sure. We'll, Former Dr. Well, Schroeder. I know. The, do the, whatever you'd like. The thing is, is though, is that he's, uh, like he's, he's such, a lot of people really, uh, revise their, their opinion of Chris Jibble and his era, uh, over the course of that, that weekend. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, so we, we arranged to like, um, I, just to set up, set the stage a little bit. I re- recorded a commentary with him and others, uh, for the, uh, uh, power of the doctor on the, on the Friday night. And then afterwards, uh, I'm talking cause I, I broached the topic of, of doing the podcast on, on the Thursday night, very early on, I could tell that he was already into it. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to ask him. And he says, yes, absolutely. Um, and I sort of reminded him after the, uh, the commentary, Hey, you know, maybe, maybe tomorrow morning or something like that. I don't know, sometime around there. And he says, how much, you know, how much time do you need? He asked me. And I said, I don't know, 15 maybe or something. I just like sort of spitballing. It says, how about 1030? Gives us, gives us like just doubles the time that he wants to talk. Mm-hmm. And then, and then we, okay, well, okay, let's see if this works or not. And we're not sure. Uh, and I go and I meet him and he's at like 1030 on the nose. Uh, he comes out from the green room and says, sorry, as if, he, as if, as if he thinks that he's late for something or not. And it's like, no, you're, you're, you're perfectly on time. You're just that nice. So He's a nice chap. He's a nice chap, and it's a great it's conversation. Surprisingly lovely. For Very somebody that high up in the TV pantheon. I, I know it, it's it's really crystallized my opinion that no one awful has made Doctor Who. <laughs> it's just like we just we are consistently not dis- disappointed by meeting people eh, who make. We Doctor will be Who. at some point. But are we, we? Haven't been yet. We've been doing yeah. this a long time. A no, long but I'm just saying at some point we will meet somebody who's. Not yeah, so great. Russell T. Davies just, just a rampant a hole. Just like, oh man, just the worst <laughs> I, person I, I alive. I no. just, the thing is, the thing is, if Russell T. Davies. Uh, I don't know personally or anything, but but I bet I would bet he presents a good present presentation because as as you'll hear in the interview, he is a creature of the media, so he's very good at being a friendly forward face for the show, and that's what we would get if we interviewed him. So. That's true. Which we did not. As which we did not. No, we interviewed Chris Chibnall, which is great. Uh, we, we, you know, touch on topics like, uh, like promotion, budgets, uh, writer's room, uh, Jody Whitaker, the, uh, the, the amazing COVID, uh, video that they made, uh, making COVID Disney plus all sorts of topics are on the table. So, uh, without further ado, let's go right now to our feature length chat with Dr. Who show owner, Chris Chibnall. <laughs> Uh, so we're sitting here in uh, in our room. Hello, Warren. Hello. Uh, with outgoing Doctor Who showrunner Chris Chibnall. Outgoing. Outgoing. <laughs> you're, 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 you're already. You're, as as you describe yes. yourself yes. on the commentary last <laughs> night, unemployed. <laughs> yeah, we'll work for tips. Yeah. How, how are you enjoying things this weekend? Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I really didn't know what to expect um, at all, uh-huh. um, except I watched. Matthew Jacobs documentary Doctor Who Am I mm-hmm. before I came it was on uh, ITVX streaming service in the mm-hmm. UK I thought oh it's there and I watched that and um, I was like I wonder if that's that seems like it's a beautiful film and I mm-hmm. actually emailed him about it um, but um, it's such a beautiful film and I thought that feels like that 
possibly could have been made for like <laughs> three people and right. I'm one of them yeah, right. um, <laughs> as a primer on what you might expect but it's been so overwhelming in a, the most positive possible sense it's so emotional and emotive mm-hmm. and the scale of it here right. the organization is astonishing um and the people are extraordinary extraordinary it's mind-blowing uh-huh yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, what were you expecting? Like, like just the reaction. Do you do you have any indication at all what you think you would you'd be in for? No, no, because you're so in a bubble making the show. You know, we make the show mm-hmm. in a in studios in Cardiff. You're going to work every day. You're doing that stuff, but you're not thinking about these moments. I mean, we we'd done Comic Con in Jody's first season, both San Diego and New York. But obviously, that's a, they're a different beast in terms of mm-hmm. their purpose. And it's that they're broad. Thing, really. yeah. yeah, yes, it is key art. That's exactly right. And those were amazing experiences. This is, it's like the experience of Comic Con dialed up to 10 of intensity in a, an emotion in a great way because mm-hmm. it's, and because it's all Doctor Who. It's not Marvel and Star Trek and all that kind of stuff. You right. Know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to dip back a little bit just because I, I want to mention it and I want to have you uh, time to sip your coffee. <laughs> I'll do these long with secret. Do you know it's secret in the green room here? Uh-huh. There's a secret stash of PG tips tea bags from England <laughs> that, some, <laughs> that Tony, who runs the green room, has bought over there. As the, every English guest comes in, he's like, if you need the secret tea, right. <laughs> <laughs> you get that. So, slip of tea off mic. Right. Uh, I want to mention. Uh, a show that has been recently brought to my attention that my wife, Erica, who you met last night after the Power yeah. of the Doctor commentary, she loves a show you did called Born and Bred. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Where's she watching that? She watched it like 20 years ago. She's going through a rough patch, and wow. she, she it was just the <laughs> wow. show yeah. that she needed. Right. And I've I've seen a couple of... It just showed up on uh, Canopy, I think it oh, was. Okay. It's like okay. a, it's a different streaming service here. Okay. And, oh, it's Born and Bred. And she was so excited. <laughs> And we started watching it. And of course, there is your name in the created by credits. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell I'm amazed. Wow. Yeah. That show, so that's the first show I ever did for yeah. TV. First hour. Um, it was uh, when I was really starting out. So I'd done fringe theater. Mm-hmm. Um, and some producers came and saw the show that I was doing. My agent put together a meeting. And they had like a piece of paper, like a piece of um, A4 paper going, ah, Sunday night, 1950s trains <laughs> uh, kind of and there was more a bit more than that and it was a bit of like it, we should do it was a, it was an idea that felt very like the titfield thunderbolt right uh the ealing comedy mm-hmm. and um and then it sort of went away and developed it and reworked it and did it and and then it and i wrote the pilot and then it got green lit <laughs> like really unexpectedly and it was sort of so what happens now what do i you have to write episode two. I don't know what happens right. in episode. I've never. I've written plays, right? And then you go on to episode two. Like I have to do that again and figure out what it is and figure out what it is over seasons. And so it was a real and obviously produced by Phil Collinson. Phil as Collinson well. right. in there, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and like, and then subsequently produced by Chris Clough, who was a classic <laughs> series director wow. who directed some, you know, <laughs> McCoy really, episodes, yeah, yeah, McCoy, yeah. and also um, oh, some Col- trial of a trial as well. Right. So, you know, um, so yeah, it, it was uh, it was incredible. It, was, it had four seasons. And um, that's where I kind of learned to, I mean, a learn what an evolving TV series how you how you work on it, but also they were great producers because I, as time went on, um, I could go and be in the edits. Mm-hmm. I was you know involved in a lot of you know production conversations. It's sort of where I started doing that and learning that. And I think the first time as a writer producer that you go into the post process it's like the the other half of the equation right. opening up and you're like oh we could oh right okay <laughs> this is where you you everything's created in the edit it really you know mm-hmm. you, it, and and also it's the last draft of your script because you're working with the reality of the material you've got rather than the kind of um the the theoretical map that the script is mm-hmm. it's so when when it's finally directed and um shot and performed uh, to then go, okay, now how do we sculpt this into a into a thing? And that's where you pretty much cut your teeth on it. Then, basically. yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. learning on the job. In a yeah, way. from I mean, I hadn't written, I hadn't had a broadcast hour of television. I had a thirty minute monologue. So James Bolam, who was the lead in Born and Bred, in the end, had done this thing I'd written for local regional London television, mm-hmm. London ITV, mm-hmm. called Storm in Norman, which I think is on YouTube. Right, um, and it's a twenty minute monologue about a tube driver on his last day at work. 
that was the only thing I'd had on TV. Oh, I did an episode of a rebooted Crossroads. Um, uh, right. So those are my two early credits. And I was like, well, and then that thing got greenlit and that went for four seasons. And I feel like it was somewhere around 20, no, hang on, probably about 30 episodes in the right. end. I don't know. I can't mm. remember. <laughs> right. 10, 20, yeah, something like that. Uh-huh. So, so that's the, my first four years of writing for television is just that every year. And it was Sunday night and it was a big, it was a big hit on BBC One. It was right. really, and it was, you know, it's everybody's, um, everybody's mum and dad loved that show. They were like, <laughs> none of my mates watch it. And it was very much, I was like, oh, we should be doing, where's all creatures great and small on yeah. the BBC now? Mm-hmm. It's, it's got a, it had know, that feel to it's it. It's got all those homages and sort of loving for that sort of show that you can, it, it, the, the equivalent of sort of a warm bath, really. I, I, it is, so you know, when you're saying about your partner that it's like it, she was going through a rough time, yeah. and it, it's like, yeah, it was built for that. It, you know what? It was charming because, you know, so much television these days is like just, you know, extended universe, and this ties into this, and everything's mm-hmm. dramatic and everything. And there's something to be said for low-stakes television, mm-hmm. for just little yeah. simple stories in a 1950s English town that are just quaint and nice and lovely, and, you know, and it's, yeah. it's, it is it's it is a warm bath, and you need those shows, you know? You do, and I think, I suspect they're probably coming back into fashion a bit now, you know? Mm. So I, I'm not suggesting for a second that's going to come back is into fashion or a reboot. Born and bred no, the next reboot. generation? Yeah, no. yeah, that's what we've come to talk about today. <laughs> I did not expect to start there. No, that's all right. I'm curious. You mentioned how you were able to sort of get in the mix with everything mm. uh, back with this show. And that used to be the case in the States. And it's not apparently not as much. So, it's uh, changing, What's isn't it like it? in England? Is it still the case that somebody start, let's say, starting out or lower level can kind of get in the mix to everything? It, that was really quite an exception at okay, the time. Yeah. But then obviously with Russell coming in on Doctor Who, uh, Paul Abbott as well, the work he was doing. Uh, there was a greater sense of the showrunner as a as a thing, but it wasn't really a thing much before the early two thousands, mid two thousands. Um, but even then, people ha- um, have struggled to get mm-hmm. because people ha- uh, producers have to give up power, space in the room. You know, it has to be more of a conversation, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and so they have to be open to it. But obviously, they hold a lot of the purse strings and the operational procedures. Um, so it's currently. Uh, there's more demand for writer producers and showrunners than there's ever been in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, but there's no training or anything like that. And so actually one of the things I've done post Doctor Who, my company has done and I, I wanted to, I came out with this, what do I do with all this useless knowledge? <laughs> that right. I have, this you is know. a struggle we have every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, I sort of did broadcast straight into Doctor Who. There's an overlap. And, and now I'm like, oh, well, how do, I'm not going to sit at home and go, well, I'll tell you how you do an edit. Um, yeah. uh, you know, my dog doesn't care. Right. Um, so uh, my company, um, we've we've created a training program for uh, backed by ITV um, uh, for next generation of showrunners oh, cool. to come through. So we're doing a six month program where every month um, we get together and we sort of take them through every step of the production process from very first idea to broadcast and transmission and, and afterwards, um, and just talk about. Where does the showrunner fit into that? What questions will be asked? What, who do you need to work with? How do you build productions? How do you build teams? How do you do post? Um, we've had loads and loads of guest speakers. We've got a session next week with some really great guest speakers coming mm-hmm. in, um, some of whom will be familiar to you. Right. Um, uh, and we meet up, and there's seven amazing writers on it. Um, and uh, because there's no showrunner training, so, mm-hmm. so I, I really wanted to do something, sort of go... You can have this knowledge. Do with it what you right, want, yeah. you know, because it's useless to you know to anybody but a very select group. So no, there's no mm-hmm. there's no training. Pe- that's a very long answer to uh, yeah. your question. But, that's um, okay. But um, it's uh, there's absolutely appetite and space, but nobody knows how to work the system mm-hmm. because there's not a written definition of what a British showrunner is and how it works. It's slightly different to the US. Um, so one of the first things we did was create that sentence and go, mm-hmm. all right, what's the definition of the job? How do you do it? What a commission is looking for. How do you find partners? Yeah, it's it's a really it's a subject close to my heart because I think you're in charge of, you know, you get a show greenlit, mm-hmm. you're in charge of thirty million quid worth of, <laughs> you're, thing, and you're just you're like artist just and CEO at the same time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, a little. What what generally in the UK is a bit more common is 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 you have a co CEO, so you're not going you're not going where do we park the trucks and where do, you're across the budget and the schedule and all that kind of stuff, but you're not. You're not ultimately wrestling with the the kind of detail of those problems, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, you need to, you have responsibility for it, and you need to know that it's going great, and the money mm-hmm. is being spent not just wisely, but really <laughs> creatively and and specifically to do the things you want to do. Um, 
so yeah, it's it's tricky. There needs to be much more training, and and that's then also about making sure um, that there's more diversity and inclusion in terms of people who are getting that access. So mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah, it's a subject very close to my heart. Yeah, right obviously, because you you brought that into Doctor Who, yeah. such a diverse writing room and, and directing credits. I think got a lot more diverse in your yes. in your time. Yes. That was obviously a specific intention on your part. It was the whole purpose of doing the job. Yeah, I, I mean, really, um, because I, I was coming off Broadchurch where it just been me. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I had coming in was I wanted to ensure that uh, the show wasn't about... For me, taking the job of showrunner was it's not about me. It's what I can uh, do in that role in terms of bringing in other voices, new voices, um, stories and creatives who are coming from backgrounds that um, maybe haven't told stories in Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. Um, And I read a book called uh, The Good Immigrant on recommendation of a a couple of people and a couple of writers in there, including Vinay, um, and also Inua Elams, uh, I think has an essay in there as well. And they both talk about watching Doctor Who as children, Mm -hmm. you know, and how important it was to them. And to read that and to, to hear those perspectives, but also to know that that they weren't seeing people who looked like them, who came from their backgrounds, who, you know, that, that it wasn't there on screen. Right. It was just a very clear and direct um, example and, and um, challenge to go, okay, these are massive opportunities. You know, we mm-hmm. talked about untold stories. How you've got a show that's been running, where, when I take it on, so that's 20... So 2016, 2017, when we're starting to work on it. And that's, what's that? So that's 54 like, oh, well years. well over 50 yeah. years. Yeah. yeah, and it's been going that way. And you think there are loads of stories that haven't even been touched upon, haven't even been. So that's a huge creative opportunity for the show. So it was about bringing in writers who could tell those stories with um, authenticity, specificity, personal investment mm-hmm. um, that could go, have you thought about this story? Have you thought about this? And then also directors... Yeah, like um, Mark Tondroy yeah. and, uh, you know, Needham and Zor and Etta Laufer, um, uh, Hao Lu Wang mm-hmm. um, across the thing. I really feel like they brought so much to the show and they, um, I, I felt like we delivered on that promise. But that was the purpose is to go all of the people who have not been as represented in the show as um, as other people have and as a, you know, a straight white male, as I feel. I've been well served by Doctor <laughs> Who over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, none of this is, I was talking about this in an interview here yesterday. Yeah. It's like, none of it is a criticism of the show or anybody's work. It's the, the opposite of that. It's going, it's just, it just felt like the moment mm-hmm. um, to open that up and to do that and, and, and to be, to understand, you know, I understood coming in that my role, it's a gatekeeping role, show running essentially. And you make your choices there as to, as to, um, what you do with that, but I was kind of, I was aware of it and and wanted to do it, and it, it's you know, I can talk about it, but it was a massive team who did it, and it's a massive. Because I was going to ask about that actually, because mm-hmm. yeah. the the writers' room that you instilled in in the first series, who's yeah. eleven. I remember you you mentioned to Gary Russell yesterday about the you had to look into the legality of it even because yeah. it's not a thing that happens mm-hmm. in the UK like it is does in North America. Yeah, that's like, right. What I do mean, you mean by the legality of it all? The BBC didn't have a contract right. that would uh, allow them to do that, so we had to go to the Writers Guild in the UK. So even when I was saying Writers Room, they're like, "We don't, we can't do that. We don't do that. Mm-hmm. We've never done that." And and they've done it. They've sorted on soaps. They've done something not quite like that, but right. but um. It it didn't exist contractually, so so it took a y- a year of discussions really? with contractual people and heads of business affairs and all this kind of stuff to go. We are, we have to do this, mm-hmm. um, and um, uh, it um, we had to go to the Writers Guild, right? <laughs> and go, we're going to do this. How do we make it work financially? What are you paying people to come in for a day? How, where's the ownership of the ideas? All that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, which obviously all goes to the BBC anyway, um, but. Um, and they had to devise wording and a contract and because it just didn't exist. And then I think they had, one of the Writers Guild people leaked to the press that Doctor Who were doing a writer's room. I was like, oops, thanks a lot. I thought those were confidential pieces of information, right. you know. Um, uh, yeah, but, you know, we, we got that done and it was an amazing thing. And, and, and also part of the purpose of it was to create, when you're bringing in a lot of new people, mm-hmm. um, uh, was to create a team and an atmosphere and a relationships between them and a, a kind of creative trust between all those people um, and being in a room with whiteboards and um, 
uh, just builds that really quickly. Um, mm-hmm. And also, I had to communicate very quickly that we were going to go places that the show hadn't gone before and how we were going to do that and what it felt like. Um, you sort of, if you're just working on stories and doing that, but you're doing it all together, right. people believe it quicker. If you're just going, yeah, and then over here we're going to do right. Rosa Parks. Mm-hmm. And I remember being in front of the rise room when I go, so, Rosa Parks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, Rosa Parks, but speed. You know, <laughs> sort of like, it's basically, get Rosa on the bus. Oh, the is bus. that, is yeah. that, that's, it's Rosa Parks sort of as a thriller question. Right. You know? And I could see there's like 10 people in front of me are like, what is happening? How on <laughs> earth, this, what, how would you ever make mm-hmm. that work? Um, and so those moments then start to spread through the group and then also the production to go, oh, okay. And so how you're building a, a kind of a tone right from the start mm-hmm. uh, in terms of what you want to do. Um, that, that It was really great for that. And also they're really, they're really great people, all of them. You yeah. Know? But it was your name that ended up on as, you know, by Chris Chibnall on a lot of the scripts, regardless. Was that a contractual thing? Was it a legality thing? Was it, or you just were the one that ended up painting the last brush across the whole thing to, to it, it, it very script by script. My name's, I mean, I, I think I did the last post on, on every, on every episode yeah, apart right. from one. And, and then if my name is on the script, then I've done either a major pass or, mm-hmm. um, uh, or a, a reworking or multiple drafts or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, which is tradition. I knew ca- coming in, you know, it's, that's true of Stephen, that's true of Russell in terms of, you know, um, pretty, you know, 90% of the scripts on the show since it's come back. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one episode, um, Tesla, um, that Nina Mativier wrote, uh, that was the only one that didn't go through. It went through my computer, but actually what it was, the final draft was um, uh, she got it into such a great place. I was like, it's really, you know, it doesn't need me. But uh, we, we just <laughs> we just stood together. We went line by line through the through the script. Uh-huh. And I went, is that the exact line of dialogue? Is that the exact stage direction? Is that the exact thing? And mm-hmm. so that's the only one I, I didn't type into scenes. She did it all herself. And, right. And we just had a kind of two-day discussion on the final draft of that so um but yeah yeah so it's you inevitably as a as a dot two show and end up doing a lot of writing you know? yeah was that i mean you said you, you were the only person on Broadchurch. yeah uh, yeah lou fox mo- who um right. co-wrote one episode because she came on board the project when it was in really early stages and it felt like I was like, this is like, it's going to be quite episodic. Mm-hmm. It's kind of serialized. And then we get into yeah. making it in episode right. three. I'm like, um, I'm really sorry about this, but it <laughs> seems to be really quite individual. And, you know, so, right. so and then in the second and third seasons, it was all just me, but obviously storylining with people. And yeah. Talk about it. yeah. So did, did you sort of say, you know, this is not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to have to make a pass on every, or did you know you were getting into the fact that you were going to have to kind of bring every script into line into what your vision for the show was um you travel hopefully so you hope not Mm -hmm. um but when you have to do it it's not like anybody's failing and it's not like they can't do it it's often just a matter of time Mm -hmm. or it might be a matter of um production or 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 just you know if you had another three months or three days or three weeks Mm -hmm. it's like they're going to get it there but it's like they're not going to get it there quick enough because also they don't have the experience they might be working on a couple of other projects it's you know because nobody's exclusive to doctor who when they're writing on doctor who apart from you know the showrunner basically um uh so it was the conversation we had when they came on board as well was you know we will we want you to get as far as possible and hopefully to you know read through and production amends and shooting script Mm -hmm. but it's based on the what we know about the production history of doctor who since 2005 and my conversations with steven and russell and seeing you know when i've been writing episodically on it um which and i I wasn't i didn't get rewritten on those so you know all those mistakes are my fault um uh, (laughs) but um but, although there are things in like Power of Three where Stephen's coming in on a scene because they're like they're in the edit and I was off doing something else. And he's right. like, I've had to put this scene and I had to put this voiceover and I have to do that. Uh-huh. Um, but um, the the uh, you the, the the kind of conversation we have with the writers coming in is it is very possible slash likely this is where it will end up that there will be a showrunner pass. Mm-hmm. Um, but we want to get you as far as possible and also we'll. That doesn't mean, okay, you have to go now. It's like every, all of those people had the offers to be on set. You know, we did read-throughs, even if, you know, and, and some things. So with, like, Mallory on Rosa, 
you know, she'd done her drafts, but also she had other commitments as well. And we were working around that to mm. get her onto the show. Um, but she is so amazing. We had such a collaborative um, working relationship with her. But but then when I did my parts, I was like, let's reverse it. You know, you've been doing your drafts and I've been giving you notes. I'll do my draft. You give me notes and, and sort of doing that. And, so, and she was really part of it and came on set. And she's extraordinary. And obviously then with some of the other writers, um, it's... Um, it, you hope that they then are taking on what that process so that when you're doing a second season episode with them, right. it can go further. They're more cognizant of the particular demands of the show. So it also needed to be kind of educative uh, and craft giving to mm -hmm. the people involved mm -hmm. as well. You know, And it's amazing now when I look at Lockwood and Company and you see Ed Heim and Joy Wilkinson, who are right? basically, you know, the, the, the two yeah. main writers on that show other than the, you know, Joe Cornish is doing one and eight and it's like, it's them, mm -hmm. you know, so, and that's thrilling. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, Doctor Who was kind of, you know, it was like 13 episodes for a while there and then it started to drop down to 12 for Peter Capaldi mm -hmm. and, and with a special and then New York's was 10. Yeah. Did, was that just like BBC inflation? Was that just, just the cost of making TV going up or was that? Well, what was COVID it? too? Was well, well, that's well I think with the, the fact, first, but... yeah, with the first two seasons, it was when I came in. I, it, it's thirteen is a is a bit punishing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, doing eleven was a. I, do you know? I can't remember. It was a way to. I think the budget had been static for quite a while, so it was a way to go. There wasn't any more money knocking about. Mm -hmm. If you do slightly less, you can amortize that. But so each episode gets a slightly higher budget, and you can think about filming you know, not in the UK occasionally and stuff like that and, and, and putting that towards visual effects. Um, but it was also, you, you, the thing you have to do as, as on Doctor Who is you have to keep projecting sort of two or three years forward because, A, it's going to take you 18 months to make a series mm -hmm. from when you start, first start thinking about it. I don't mean sort of, you know, right. year, year on year, although sometimes the turnarounds have been that. Um, but you've you've also got to think where is TV going to be in that point. So actually, mm. you know, by the end when we're doing, you know, even in our second season, you could feel the shape of TV series around the world mm -hmm. um, con conflating and and sort of not conflating, contracting. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and becoming six and eight episodes, and we're like doing eleven. You go, oh, I thought that was going to be a small version of a TV, you know, a small version of a season compared to the thirteens and fourteens that you know Russell would be doing. Um, uh, but actually it feels slightly out of step, you know, mm. and, and you sort of actually suddenly it's going out and you think, oh, that feels like every other show is a couple of episodes shorter than that now. Um, so you, you kind of want to keep track of, you always want it to feel the right shape in terms of modern television. Yeah. Uh, and that's really, and I guess, and I would say, I would say this, but you know, particularly in the last five, six years, modern television has changed absolutely yeah. entirely yeah. and it will continue to evolve um but that's why we were doing we were questioning things like okay should it should we try on sunday night yeah should we try a new year special mm -hmm. you know um uh and they're all just like elements to go does that keep it does it keep the audience engaged and interested but also is it is it just making sure that it feels a, of a place in modern television mm -hmm. that's the sort of big thing so you never really talk about that but it's that's the conversations you have with um, the commissioners at the BBC is like, how do you keep it not feeling like um, a relic? Yeah. Because the world is moving so fast. It is. Know? I mean, I think, uh, like, I think what House of Cards, I think, debuted on Netflix, I think, 2012? in 2012. 2012. Yeah. Like which yeah. is like the yeah. first prominent mm -hmm. series that dropped all at once. That's yeah. not necessarily the best model. Yeah. But, it, you know, people. The UK press, let's face it, will bash the ratings because, oh, it's, yeah. it's not getting Voyage of the Dam. Also, it's a remake of a UK series. Yeah. So you're bash for that. Too. Yeah. 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 And. <laughs> You know, but you look at it, and now we look at it, and Doctor Who is the only one that's sort of being broadcast on a terrestrial channel. Everything else is going yeah. on Disney Plus, or yeah. Star Trek's going on on Prime or Paramount mm. Plus. Yeah. I mean, this was the the battle. This is what happened in, in the five years that you were uh, doing Doctor Who. Completely, and that's you sort of have to not engage with the rating system because mm -hmm. also you go. But when you know, I'm, uh, I'm working with the producers of The Crown on something at the minute, and. And they're amazing and spectacular, and that show is extraordinary. But the UK ratings for it are about two million now. They're, they're right. starting to be audited. So, and and the Marvel shows are doing, you know, l less than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it, it's really interesting. Is is sort of, um, yeah. You're, it's not just comparing apples with oranges, but also it's like there's no narrative around that. That's, that's, that's kind of a ten or f maybe even twenty years ago conversation. Mm -hmm. Is like is, is like that. Obviously, you just 
and but how you evaluate a TV show is now. Right. I mean, I look at the the final scenes of his dark materials on the BBC. Um, he's getting one point four million and, and a nine percent share, and it's like that's like so in the Sunday at seven o'clock. So it's an amazing show. Right. It's like it's beloved mm-hmm. and it's brilliant, and it's an HBO co-production. It has you know huge yep. resources, and it's like it, it. But there's not a oh my god, you know. If it's, it was Doctor like, Who, that would have been kicked around in the ratings sure, on Monday morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have to absent yourself from that. Mm-hmm. I kind of look at it and I go, like the only figure I don't. The final overnights on Power of the Doctor, which is also a you know, standalone and it hasn't been on for a while, it's like it's the audience share that you're really looking at because, right. because that's the thing that you can compare like to like. You can't get the actual figures because people are, you know, the top, the top show now on, in, in um, the UK in terms of overnights, mm-hmm. really, other than like a Happy Valley Outlier or something, but a regular what's in the top five mm-hmm. shows, not dramas or something, which aren't really big rating overnight things right. um, is like about 3.5 million 4 million that's number one on the day that's number one on the week wow you know compared yeah. to uh, and that's and I think you know Power of the Doctor was on the overnights was something like 28 29% share mm-hmm. which is sort of what Doctor Who's been doing for mm-hmm. For you know, ever since it's come back, it's you know at points it's gone massive and gone into like forty two percent or forty six percent share. Mm-hmm. But it kind of you know any any drama now in the UK, if you're above, I mean actually if you're it's sometimes now it's you know, if you're above fifteen sixteen percent share, you're doing really well. But if you're if you're sitting in the twenties, right, you, you're doing well. And so that's the only thing. So you can't get involved in the narrative. And I know it's a real. You know, fans, and you know, I, I totally understand that. It was the same yeah. when you know you follow it and you obsess over it. And you go, "Oh my god, this and that." <laughs> right. And there was never a point in conversations with the people. They were like, mm-hmm. "We want this. We want it on Sunday night. We want it. We want to try it out on New Year's Day." You know, right. there's like lots of um, one of the hard. It's not hard, but it's one of the things about being a showrunner that you have to learn to accept mm-hmm. is. Your intent is constantly questioned. Right. <laughs> you go, that's not our intent. We're not doing that for that reason. And so, so that's the sort of hardest thing. So you sort of have to, to move away from any conversation about the ratings or these things. You know, I know some people are really like, why is there no Christmas special with Jodie? As if it's mm-hmm. like a militant policy. And it was like, <laughs> we had a conversation at the start. I was like, I wonder if we should try. The BBC was saying, there's been a lot of Doctor Who Christmas specials. There's been a lot of stories with snow in. And maybe... <laughs> was that maybe, their subtle hint to sort of say uh, maybe things were like, It was a commissioner. You know, one of the, one of the, there was about three commissioners. And, and there was a commissioner who just went, maybe, you know, maybe just think about that. And, and it's like, and we were just like... And also, a lot of their big dramas were premiering on New Year's Day. It had become mm-hmm. a bit Sherlock would play there. Dracula would play there. You know, Happy Valley plays there now. So it was like, well, let's try that the first year and see what happens. Right. And it's not like a... I hate the Christmas specials. You know? right. I love them. I love them. And actually, Spyfall was going to go out on Christmas Day, and was then it? it was too scary. It was oh, uh, the uh, editorial really? policy. That was how well, I was thought. Yeah, and also it's like, where do you put the second part? So, it, for there was a moment where that was going to be Christmas Day, Boxing Day. Oh wow! Yeah, and it, so it wasn't like a whole every year. It's like. Do not come to me and mention a Christmas special. It's like, it was like, I hate Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Like, I love Christmas. Chris Chibnall killed Christmas. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Also, the other it's, big takeaway: you know, stats don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't care. Yeah. Um, you, so you're you're having you're, you're having to keep up with the modernity of conversations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so in the sec- and then in the third season they were like, yeah, let's do New Year's Day mm-hmm. that one as one of the three final specials or. Um, so it's it's really you're constant you are constantly questioning these things and testing them and sometimes it comes down to logistics or right. how do you if you launch Spyfall on Christmas Day and Boxing Day when is it a series launching because mm-hmm. then there's a big gap and how do you do a second series launch and does that help and right. you know all that kind of stuff is is your live I know and I know it conditions people's responses and you sort of see it through that prism mm-hmm. but like I say it, it, often you feel like. You're doing the work and the decisions you're taking, you're taking them because you're getting data yeah. um, and you're having conversations with people who really know, which, you know, I think the move to Sunday night for Jodie's era in the, in the UK has been, was a massive success mm-hmm. in terms of that. And it just refreshed everything and made people look at it again. But it's like, it doesn't mean now you do that right. ongoing or constantly. It's like you constantly, you're doing it for the moment you're in, mm-hmm. you know, as a, to keep it live. Yeah, it, it was... I mean, your time sort of also uh, saw a transition from just in the way the TV industry, but also the way that, like the the position of brand manager sort of expired at the end of the uh, Steve Moffat era, and everything was sort of brought in house yeah. for the BBC, and then 
BBC America, I think, was starting to lose funds on there, but you could kind of tell that they were kind of starting to, to fade yeah. in the obscurity. Was this was this a factor? Was this a problem, perhaps, that you were having to deal with in, in this sort of, you know, because, you know, I, I in from my view, it was almost like the BBC promo department says, okay, we've promoted that show. Okay, what's next on? Oh, Doctor Who is premiering in 10 days. Let's, let's do a promo. You know, it was kind of being treated like the other shows were when before it felt like they had a little bit more of a of a spotlight i suppose when they had a specific uh promo team i don't know if that was that matches reality no but. i don't think it does i mean i think if you look at the work around our first series particular first mm-hmm. season in particular there was a massive campaign there's a massive mm-hmm. domestic campaign mm-hmm. bbc america were the ones who paid for us to come out to the comic cons and yep. do that and to do to get hall h and a cover of entertainment weekly and you know um, I think it's inevitably with a second season and a third season of a, of a Doctor they're kind of like we did that in the first year and also budgets are shrinking mm-hmm. the BBC is under attack um, the BBC you, you know for, for sort of something like Flux for example um, they uh, their budget is they, they can only really advertise on the BBC um, mm-hmm. because they you know they, they have to make keep doing the same amount of things with less money it's right. just the fact of um, at where the BBC is, and uh, you know, so it's why like the Disney partnership is so mm-hmm. amazing and like five years overdue, you know, you know and <laughs> yeah. that's not, yeah, yeah, everybody was really doing their best, but also there was a transition to BBC Studios from BBC in house, which yeah. was done while I was uh, before we'd even got into production. I literally got an email going, by the way, you're mm-hmm. going to be employed by BBC Studios now, like before I even started on the job, I was like. Okay, right. <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, but I think the um, uh, I, I think those marketing teams are, are really brilliant in what mm-hmm. they do, but it, it's um, it's it's hard to punch through, and you need big budgets. And also, I think what promotion is is another thing that has changed mm-hmm. with television. You know, if you look at any show on Netflix, generally there are exceptions, but generally. They don't do. It just drops. They, it drops. Yeah. And yeah. Netflix is its own marketing campaign. Yeah. I was talking to somebody from Netflix and they said, everybody obsesses with posters and trailers and all this kind of stuff. With Netflix, it's like the biggest marketing asset of Netflix is Netflix. Mm-hmm. Because it's on your TV every day. Right. <laughs> it's like the, that's marketing. Netflix mm-hmm. is marketing you Netflix. Yeah. It's like they've, they've done this code and everything else is now 10 years out of date. Mm-hmm. It's not to say uh, trailers, posters. It's not to say that stuff isn't important and, mm-hmm. and gives you... A sense of it and and in the world but it's it's all of these things that you think are true are not automatically true anymore right. <laughs> and you so you're constantly and and everybody in the tv industry is going what does this mean how does this work what is this it, it's it's an amazing time but you yeah you do you do have to keep up and um you have the resources you have and and we also had you know massive inflation massive talent inflation mm-hmm. um you know um so there's all those sorts of things, but yeah, yeah. But also, it's hard. It's hard to talk about the show because you can, you sometimes end up talking about only the challenges, right? You know, and only, and it sounds like you know, it's sort of why if I have to be really careful in interviews and, and and how many to give because it's like those are the things people want to know, right? But actually, it's not the experience of making it. It's like that's one day out of your year is like when you're talking about those things and that campaign and how how many resources they do or don't have, mm-hmm. and you can influence it to a certain extent, but you also it, they're coming to you going, this is the budget, this is the promotional budget, this is what we're going to do, and you can work within those parameters, you know. There's also things like, with the BBC, the average age of the viewer on BBC One is now over 60, you know. Wow. So it's like people don't come to the BBC at the moment, you know, mm-hmm. and they're trying to change it, and they're trying to do a digital. But it's like, Doctor Who was the only show, people, and, and I saw the presentation of the data on this, it's like the only show that a certain portion of the audience come to the BBC to watch. They come to the BBC to watch, they watch Doctor Who, and they go. Right. That starts to fade because people are not in the habit of watching the BBC. Mm-hmm. But also, how do you reach those people to let them know Doctor Who is on if you can only do a BBC campaign? Right. You're like, these challenges are real and, and extraordinary, and everybody's trying to figure those things out. Mm-hmm. But it's like, if you want to do that, you've got to spend X millions, which, and even then, there's no guarantee that will do that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you're constantly working in this evolving media environment. Um, and, um, yeah, I think the brand manager, it, we had someone lined up to be a brand executive, a brand president um, when uh, we had somebody amazing. And, and um, when I took the job on, or just after I took the job on, and then they were, they didn't, it didn't get over the line. So the, the oh, approach really? is going to be very, very different. And um, 
would have been fantastic, but they couldn't. The, the studios couldn't get the mm -hmm. the deal done in the end. Um, yeah. So it's like you know, it, you're working in the real world, and yeah. I know it's yeah. like. And as fans, yeah. you just go, "Why aren't they doing this? Or why are they doing this?" It's like. It's it's not like people haven't thought about it or aren't trying or don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. It's like you are working against um, Warner's mm -hmm. and HBO and you know uh, the Wizarding World yeah. and you know all these kind of which are unbelievably resourced. You know, yeah. But the thing we have is we're making Doctor Who, and that, and to my point about like the best thing about doing Doctor Who is making Doctor Who, and the joy <laughs> of that uh -huh. is like the thing that nobody says. Is it really fun to do? And you're like, I can tell you a week of stories about how much fun it is to right. do and to go, you know, and to see Arwell and Dava sending me a WhatsApp of um, a junkyard Dalek mechanism that will mean we don't have an operator. And, you know, right. it's, it's like fun every day. You know? Right. And we never focus on that. We're nerds and we just think, well, how, you know. Well, we're, we want to see how the sausage is made. We do. Right? We're and, interested and, and in logistics. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And it I'm is. the same, but it's like, but I think, yeah, like it's, it, you, you don't get many opportunities to go, oh, my goodness me, this is amazing. Right. You know? um, and I think it's like uh, it, it, it ends up being, and then sort of narratives get placed on times or eras or what, or people or whatever, and it's like mm. they're not really true, yeah. any of them. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So, yeah. wisdom has never been true. That's really true. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the only thing that's true. Yeah. We didn't think that for decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's like, what we, I mean, we were talking before we started recording because, uh, Stephen, you're wearing a Beatles T-shirt. I am. And we were talking about um, Get Back, the, the Paul Jackson that's pretty much um, Peter Jackson, yeah. Peter Jackson, Paul Jackson. <laughs> uh, at least, um, uh, and just saying, well, the received wisdom of the Let It Be sessions mm -hmm. is misery. Mm -hmm. It's quite brown. It's, you know, it's grainy. Yeah. They were all grainy on the day. Yeah. Um, uh, and they were having a terrible time. And then you watch that and you go, it was joyous. It yeah. was delightful. And you see creativity happening in front of you. And mm -hmm. it's like, that's, I sort of feel like it's very easy for narratives around production on anything to be like oh i heard this thing and therefore that's true and now all of that now that, that's true of everything to do with the only show that i have that to time. work with yeah so and it's I'm not true it, yeah. and you you get all sorts of things i remember the thing that and also people lie <laughs> is the thing <laughs> you know and yeah. it's like i remember the first week we were shooting we had a call from a journalist when we were doing um women who fell to earth we were doing the crane sequence yeah. first Whew, uh, that was amazing. It was like, first time Doctor Who. We're down in the docks. There's two cranes because of you, Chris? And it's, yeah. you know, 1 a.m. And it was like we went down. It was the most joyous thing. Jody, seeing Jodie go up in a scissor lift to go on a crane. Right. I, I've never seen anyone happier in my life. <laughs> I'm now, I still have a video of that, of her waving at everyone, going, right. I'm going up. Um, but I remember we got a call from a journalist the next day towards, you know, and we where they said, yeah, we've heard that... Um, uh, everybody's few, the crew are refusing to work. Um, Jody's making them work till two a.m. There's a really bad atmosphere on set, and we were like, I was like, I will call the journalist and go. We are, we are having the best time. <laughs> like literally, the crew adore her. She's having a great time. Mm -hmm. It's scheduled to go till four. We'll send you the call sheets. It's right. scheduled to go four a.m. We're on night shoots, but it's like that's and that is a symbol of that happens every couple of days on Doctor Who forever right. somebody's ringing up and going i've heard this mm -hmm. and it's a negative story and and in order to get stories and stuff and so that's also part of it and that's so, and then some of those come out and you go none of that is true and mm -hmm. and but it can become but as but as fans you're receiving that mm -hmm. as this is what's happening on the show you know yeah. so so it's and i don't know how you combat that you know you can combat it with lots of white noise but you know it's you also have to go this is how the modern me media works this is how Social media works is people can say things and they're just not true. And you know. right, I will say mm -hmm. the positive side of that is the Daily Star in the UK published an exclusive showbiz story uh, saying in the first season saying that Jodie was about to get a talking cat companion, <laughs> <laughs> and I have that framed <laughs> because that's my favourite. You can make that up. That's yeah. great. Thank you, Peter Dyke. I said that to him in the end. Yeah. That's fantastic. It was a full page right. in a newspaper. A talking cat. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, no, I wouldn't be against it. Yeah. <laughs> no. Right. You know. I was, oh, yeah. Maybe we should have. Uh, that didn't wind up on the bucket list then for the uh, talking the cat. Have just a quick. If it shows tea. up in RTDs, there you can. Yeah, 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 he's got, yeah. He can, he can have that. No, no. I would have loved to have done. K9, but we, yeah. you know, they, we didn't get that. Jody and K9 was the thing I wanted. Oh, but, really? Um, yeah, but you, the, the, you can't get the rights. Oh, yeah, of course, the rights. So, yeah. Yeah. Was it always going to be three years right from mm. the get go? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Did, um, did you know just how much work it would be to say, you know, three years is like, did you like, like, 
Peter Davison walk into Patrick Charlton when he started Doctor Who and, mm. says, and he says only do three. Uh, did you like uh, run to Philip Hinchcliffe and he said like huh. only three years for you? Oh, I, I mean, I did write to Philip Hinchcliffe, but um, <laughs> but not about that. I said come and visit the set because I'm here because of you, and he did that, and that was that oh, was amazing. Did he really? Oh wow! Um, but I was, um, I, yeah, I think that that Patrick Trout and Peter Davison thing is in my head from that that knowledge, but also. A conversation with Jodie right at the start because mm. she, you know, Broadchurch was the first returning show she'd ever done. She came from film, she, you know, so it, that, and that was nobody was optioned off the first season of Broadchurch. It was just going to be one and mm-hmm. one and done, it, kind of Done-ish. one and done. Although I was like, well, I might have a couple more anyway. <laughs> right. No, let's just do this. Um, uh, but um, even in conversations about that, it's, you had to talk to the actors and go, well, let's try this. And she, she was. I've never done a second season of something. That's really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, there were various things in terms of timings, in terms of family life for both of us, that it was, you know, that we knew we had things we wanted to do with our families. We had things coming up. My kids had their GCSEs and A-levels in the same year. In, uh, so in, in 2022, it was like, so for me, it was a hard end date of, I do not want to be working on the show in 2022. I mean, I ended up doing a bit of post and stuff, but right. but but that was always from the start. And but but also with Jody, it was just a, we had a very clear conversation. It's like let's do three years because you can get a three year arc mm-hmm. or three seasons, and you know, and obviously even that ends up being disrupted or slightly different. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you want that arc, and also what we had a pack was we will go together as mm-hmm. well. You know, and there were like light conversations about you know the, there were conversations with the BBC at a certain point and they were like are you sure is she sure what do you want to do you know but it's like there wasn't really a world where either of us would go for that and actually we ended up doing more because we ended up doing extra specials and, yeah. and, and actually once the pandemic comes in it's like all bets are off yeah. you know yeah. really so, so it's like again it's the sort of did you have a plan did it work out it's like <laughs> there was definitely a plan kind of worked out we did sort of what we said we do but we, right. it wasn't in the same shape so but yes short answer yes it mm-hmm. was it was always that and you know yeah and i really did not want to do the 60th really yeah 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 you yeah, were yeah, like yeah, yeah like the episode itself or just the act the act of making such a massive giant finale like what uh what 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 drove you away from not wanting to do that uh because i thought well i'd have been in for you know x amount of years and, right well so i'd have had to wait a whole year i guess yeah yeah, yeah. yeah uh, but i'd have had to have done you know but also it, because i think it just the show thrives on energy and the show thrives on regeneration right. and, and it thrives on, uh, it was just not a it was not a thing that mm-hmm. i was like looking at and going because also then and he, he, you know, then if you were doing a new doctor or something, then but then you have to stay on and see that doctor. Mm-hmm, right. for really, you know, I mean, you have to. But but uh, yeah, it just didn't feel. It did, that's a long time then, yeah. all of a sudden, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, no, no, it wasn't. And also that you know that's what's great about this year already. You can feel the en- the, the crackle and the energy, right. mm-hmm. and it's sixtieth and it's new, mm-hmm. and, and, I've, and you know, and so then to have Russell doing it, and then David coming out, and then sh- amazing shooty coming in. You yeah. know, that's like that's exactly what it needs you mm-hmm. know um so yeah no 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 it was never uh, no no how did how did i mean obviously it affected everyone but how did covid i made it really easy hit with you you were one of the few shows doing it yeah you we, actually did it, yeah we but, shot for a year yeah. yeah we shot for a year continuously we never shut down mm-hmm. uh, and I, I don't think it was any other show that that kind of um didn't shut down um it, I mean, it was just really hard. It was less mm-hmm. fun because you're everybody's yeah. distancing, everybody's masked. Um, for uh, the, all of the story work was done over Zoom, you know, and right. we also doing, and we had to reformat the show entirely and go, you know, okay, this, you know, there's certain things you have to. The big thing, and again, I was talking about this on stage yesterday here, was um, the sort of the we had to we spent. I, would, I don't know, Nikki Wilson, Cerise Doyle, Matt Strevens, and me, we kind of, it took us four months to figure out, there was just a point where it's like, you can't make Doctor Who in the pandemic. You can't do it. Like, mm-hmm. nobody's doing it, and mm-hmm. they're struggling to make, make EastEnders. We would hear rumours, it was like, EastEnders tried to move a piece of scenery yesterday, mm-hmm. and it took two hours, <laughs> you know, because of distancing and because of, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh my goodness, you know, and mm-hmm. they, they, you know. Um uh, you know, the email trails across all of that will look like some weird historical document when you see all <laughs> right. that. Um, but, um, 
the uh, it took four months to go. How could you make it? Mm-hmm. You know, where are the obstacles? Where are the obstructions? And uh, and how? What would that mean? You know, and it was like, okay, you'd have to have a lot fewer sets. So there, and I was like, okay, but what if we reused them? You know, and, he, and then you're also at the back of your head talking about, you know, Trouss and Davison in three years. When right. I look at this, I'm going, mm-hmm. okay, Ark in Space and Revenge of the Cybermen. They reused yeah, that. Nice. What's okay? <laughs> there's, there's, pre- there's always a precedent on Doctor Who yeah, where you yeah. go, it's that, you know. Mm-hmm. When somebody goes, oh, you're doing these historicals. I'm like, it's William Hartnell historicals. Right. They're right, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was just, okay, well, uh, these, we would, and you could, you couldn't have less characters. You, it, you um, so some people are going to have to come back and you go, but what's interesting with that is you sort of go, you're sort of going back to making an old fashioned six parter. Right. You know, yeah, <laughs> in, in yeah. a, but you know, really, but except you want to make it as episodic as you can. So it's a re- a weird hybrid of it. Mm-hmm. But, but, it, but what I loved about it is it then brings creative Benefits, but also risk. Yeah. This creative risk is where Doctor Who should live, I think, you mm-hmm. know, and not everybody's going to agree with that. And, you know, some people would much prefer familiarity, and, you know, I understand that. But it was always coming in. It's like, how do you keep a 54 year old show fresh and doing things and startling sometimes and, you know, and reassuring others and, right. you know, and bring a, a variety of tones in? Um, so, it, yeah, it disrupted everything. We had to reimagine the production of the show reimagine the narrative structure of the show reimagine mm-hmm. how you brought actors in and out but to reimagine how you do prosthetics mm-hmm. in with mm. covid and you know people like craig Ells and um uh and um swarman as sure you know th- those guys were in at like 3 a.m you know right. so mm-hmm. on, on days when they were shooting you know normally they'd be in at i don't know five or you know half yeah. four, but it's like it's another two hours on their day because you, everything has to move slower and be distanced mm-hmm. and everybody mm-hmm. speak because it's so, yeah. before vaccines essentially right. yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's all yeah. about distancing and yeah yeah yeah, yeah i think the first we i think we started in october november um 2020 is that right yeah, yeah i think so um and then we had about six weeks shooting before christmas and then a two-week stand down mm-hmm. and those six weeks were the hardest i've known on anything ever and everybody was so on edge right so tense and we were doing big things you know we were in the i mean in the crimea in, <laughs> in the right bottom. it's my fault you know they're, they're in the rain and the fog and all that weather yeah. you see on screen in um in the santaran episode there's not a lot of CG other than the soldiers. Right. You know, yeah. it's like it was miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but you're also looking at Russia's and going, "This is fantastic," you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was very difficult. Everybody was really scared, mm-hmm. you know, because of the and 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 also. But what it did, and the thing that's the most kind of s- small, micro and macro stressful is you're in a job where every day everything can stop. And everything can break right. because mm-hmm. if one person gets COVID, everything stops. And if you, and also there was there was a whole thing with insurance that you you might not be able to get the right insurance. So it's like if it stops, it maybe just stops and you throw it all away. Right. It was such high stakes producing, um, and the the you know the reason, and that's a year we shot, which I don't think Doctor Who's ever shot that continuously for a year. Maybe mm-hmm. you know not not for a long, not for a few years at least. Um, to make especially to make that few episodes yeah. you know mm-hmm. um but the the thing about that and the thing that kept it going was jody like she didn't go out for a year right she isolated and bubbled with you mm-hmm. know like mandip and john and uh, it's like the sacrifice that she made and the sacrifice that the crews made but also you know when the the time the history of doctor who comes to be written covid supervisors may not get that much of a mention mm. um uh, there are three or four people on the show their responsibility was to keep everybody safe. Mm-hmm. And they did that for a year and they did testing. And it's, it's like those things are what get the show on air. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it was, yeah, it, it, everything was challenged. Yeah. Well, you, speaking of Jodie isolating, was it her idea to do the thing in the closet, which to this day is inspiring? Oh, uh, <laughs> funnily enough, we, we, um, yeah, I should look on my phone, but we, we literally WhatsApped each other mm-hmm. on the same morning. And I was like, I'm thinking, and it's really, uh, it's really, it's going to sound really grandiose, and I don't mean it. It didn't come from that place, but there was a point when it was obviously there were the national announcements. Everybody's yeah. in mm-hmm. lockdown, you know. And I'm, and I just WhatsApp Jody going, feel like everybody needs to hear from the doctor right now. Mm-hmm. And it sounds ludicrous now as we talk in a yeah. place in LA, you know. <laughs> yeah. and it's like, but, but I just went, if I'm 
a kid, mm-hmm. if I may, and I'm, we're into lockdown and there's a pandemic and you're basically hearing on the news, this could be the end of humanity if we don't all stay inside. Right. I really need to hear from the doctor. It's going to be all right. And I don't know how we do this. Right. And she was like, I think that's exactly, I was, you know, she was like, I was just typing the same, you know, on WhatsApp, mm. you're seeing somebody typing. I'm like, yeah. So what's happening here? <laughs> and I was like, okay, how do we do this? And she said, let's just keep it to ourselves for the moment. I said, mm. what if I just write something for you? And maybe we could, you know, she's like, I've got the coat. I've got the coat at home. Right. Because, you know, we're all in lockdown. We're not yeah. making Doctor Who at this point. Yeah. This is the March, it's is it? Very, yeah. like very early days. Of yeah. This yeah. Pandemic. yeah. And I think it was probably just after the big, you know, Boris Johnson announcement in the UK and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I, I can't remember what the dates are. Um, and um, uh, so she, <laughs> she went to find the coat, right. she, which she got at home, because um, I think she did some hospital visits in the coat, and that's mm-hmm. why she had it at home. I mean, not COVID hospital. Pre, Pre-COVID, but, but yeah, yeah. yeah. That's mm-hmm. why she had it. Um, and um, uh, so I sort of wrote something quickly and then sent it to her mm-hmm. or just on what it's like everything was done by whatsapp <laughs> so i sent that i'm like okay here's a kind of monologue and she was like i could film it in my cupboard i've got the cup- i could film it in my cupboard i was like okay yes okay right and so then she sent it back with you know a couple of things and right. she went oh I, we don't need to say that we would do that uh it went back and forth once i think and sent it back and then she just sent it to me mm-hmm. <laughs> she's she just like See what this is, and then we can do it again. And I think that's that's what we put out. Take one. And so then I was like, I guess we have to tell some people or ask permission, or I don't. <laughs> right. We yeah. Maybe need to tell the BBC that we have this thing. Would they be okay? And you know. And then everybody at the BBC was like, and I sent it to Piers Wenger and Charlotte Moore, who mm-hmm. like the big you know head honchos at the BBC in yep. terms of their relationships, Doctor Who. Um, and it, that I think it took a, a couple of days for them to go. Yeah, no, this is okay. We mm-hmm. we should do this, and then it. It went out and, and yeah, it was, yeah. So it was, we just both had the same thought and it was like, right. I don't know. I don't know if it's right. And you didn't want to be pompous or. You don't want the imagined video. Which was, which had good intentions. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but it was yeah. just like, I thought it's just that thing. You're constantly, as a Sharon, I think you're constantly going, what is it going to feel? How, how am I eight years old feeling about this? How are my kids feeling about this? Mm-hmm. How am I? you know, um, uh, nephew and niece feeling about this and what would anything help? And right. to be, to have that role in Doctor Who at that point, I think we both felt, well, m- this might just make a difference. And, mm-hmm. and, and also it was J- that Jodie's Doctor has that... Um, that caring nature. That vibe, yeah, yeah, it'd be yeah. the first thing she would be doing. She was like, oh, I must yeah. send that message about the pandemic yeah. to 2020. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it's sort of one of the things I'm most, proud of and actually and then you know it goes out and then i'm watching the 10 o'clock news for the pandemic updates i'm like oh jody's on the news <laughs> and i think she filmed in a cupboard is played out on the news at 10 in the uk i was like oh, this is insane you know that's yeah. those are incredible doctor who moments like her reveal th- video you know mm-hmm. you're just like oh this is you know you just never know when it's it's going to go so yeah mm-hmm. it was a yeah yeah I, the, the little things i forget about that but yeah. it was so hugely important to us in that moment well, take it from me it didn't just inspire little kids it it, it inspired a lot of people right. yeah you know, i mean i'm sort of talking down in terms of that oh, it's I know, like, I know, it's, yeah, I'm, yeah. you know i'm writing to myself you're always mm-hmm. writing to yourself and it's mm-hmm. like but i kind of needed to hear from the doctor and, and yeah you know you sort of have to go i hope other people feel the same so yeah. did you have to hear from her i mean like yeah, at, yeah, at yeah, what yeah. point did you sort of like you know we all had dark thoughts in the early days they go what is going to happen to the world? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you have any doubts that your last season might not ever be made because of yeah, oh, just not just that, not just that. There was a, there was um, a week where it was not going to be made. Oh, wow. uh, there was a week where I was I'd been off on another job, and mm-hmm. because the BBC were just like we not BB, the BBC studios, uh, and it was like where's the money coming from? How are we going to do this? Is it too difficult? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it literally went down to the wire of like yeah, there was an hour on one day when it was like it was done. Uh, uh, and um, uh, yeah, we had to do. There are certain things I had to do to get that season made mm-hmm. uh, because they couldn't find a way to do it. And and so yes, yes, there absolutely was. And that was like, okay, we might have to be going. Okay, so Revolution of the Daleks. That that's it. Because also Jody, you know, Jody had a thousand job offers, and, mm-hmm. and and everything was changing. You know, obviously she had a contract and option, but also you know. I know what job she gave up to do the third season, which obviously because it had moved in the schedule, you know, yeah. she had stuff lined up for when we were supposed to finish shooting, but then was delayed by the pandemic. And, you know, it's 
she's in demand and so she sacrificed a lot everybody sacrificed a lot you know but again you see now yeah. it's like we're into that <laughs> everybody sacrificed and painful know, and yeah, it's not yeah. that at all but but yeah 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 we did have those moments yeah completely mm-hmm. and and there's, yeah 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 there's some things like <laughs> I, i'll just keep to myself right yeah of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. did yeah. did you have like a, an idea mapped out for that third season before covid came along and ruined everything uh, it was pretty nascent mm-hmm. um uh, but we were talking to writers. We knew which writers we were using. That was the hardest thing is like, you know, a lot of the you know, people like Pete McTie and Ed Heim and uh, Nina uh, and, and Vinay and you know, all those people. We were talking about what their stories would be. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, that was really difficult. And you know, But it was quite early stages um, because you could see it coming for a You could see the pandemic coming. You're like, yeah, this is, you know, this mm-hmm. is going to be hard. Um, so... Uh, it never got that far. It's not like a missing season. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes you're like, that missing season where they had all those scripts and the thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. It wasn't that. It was more like it, it, we stopped ourselves in our tracks. Right. I remember storylining with Vinay for one day and going at, at the BBC uh, in um, White City. And I remember going <laughs> into the loos and it was like suddenly every, there was just suddenly massive posters up on how to wash your hands. Mm-hmm. And it was like, it had just gone up like since like at lunchtime, everything. It was right. like, I don't know if we're going to get to make this, you yeah, know? Right. And yeah. we're like in really early stages of it, you know? So it was just, you could, you, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like it came out of nowhere, was it? You know, mm-hmm. it's like even before Christmas, you, there was the talk of something's happening. And, you know, so, so you could just feel the cloud approaching. So yeah, yeah, yeah we had, yeah, it, that was hard not working with all those people, knowing we would have to, reduce episode count in order to get it done mm-hmm. yeah yeah but you did do it yeah you did get it done. yeah 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 and yeah, and yeah. by the end of the, your last season of, of recording it it was a lot you know you were hot you were you know quarantining in bubbles and stuff but yeah. the end things had gotten a little more lax and hopefully a little more celebratory yeah yeah uh, completely yeah yeah i mean we were still doing covid protocols though on power of the yeah. doctor so you mm-hmm. know but yes yeah, yeah yeah and we had a and we did have a proper rap party and you know all that kind of stuff so yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah do you think you'll ever write for the show again? No. <laughs> <laughs> no? I've done a lot, you know. Yeah, it's, you like, it's like yeah. 2000 and then Torchwood as well. And, and you know, that's, it's a lot of episodes and it's a lot of stuff and it's a lot of material. And I absolutely love it. But it's also like there are other things yeah. I, to, I need and want to write. Mm-hmm. And it's like you have, to, you have to make those choices. So, no. And also because, you know... Like, it's not like there's anything about what I've left unsaid. You know? right. I mm-hmm. had the opportunity and I had the control. And, and also it's like, I don't want to take up that slot. I want to see somebody who's never in for Doctor Who coming in and doing and doing that under Russell or whatever, you know, and, and, and people, you know, from, from um, backgrounds that haven't yet got into the show or the writing team or the directing. So that's the most exciting thing is I'm going, I want to see what their Doctor Who is. That's mm-hmm. always what is thrilling because that's like, that's going to give you something where you go, oh, you know, it's the exciting thing about shooting that you just think, wow, where right. is that going to go? Mm-hmm. Where it's so thrilling. It's know? made entirely of charm, from what I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An amazingness. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's like a wonderful, brilliant, perfect bit of casting, and I, mm-hmm. I've you know only seen him in terms of sex education, and other stuff that he's done. Yeah. But um, yeah, how fantastic is that? No, no. And so no, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to <laughs> just want to watch it. Like, yeah. And I've had to say to Russell, please don't tell me. Like he told me two things at the start. I was like, don't. Tell me these things. I want to, you right. know. So yeah, no, no, no. I'm much more excited to be a viewer. Did he tell you which doctor was going to appear at the end of Pilot of the Doctor? Because that, that the tenant rege- a yeah. bit was shot well after the fact. Yeah, yeah, it was done, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Did he tell you who it was going to be, or did you? Yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. Oh right. yeah, because I had to sign off the episode. I, I was <laughs> oh, actually course, like, yeah. I was actually. Can you not tell me? And can I not see that bit? And um, Cerise, who's our post production exec, was like. You have to sign this. You have to watch it and approve. They'll do it, but you have to sign it. Off. Right. Like, oh. And I was like, oh, I don't. I was like, I don't want to see anything. I don't want to eat. And then I, they sent it to me, and I was like, Well, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. And now I'm back in the. I'm back on the sofa again. It was. Uh, it was just perfect, you know. So mm-hmm. it was great. Cause, yeah. Because yeah. Doctor Who's the. You know, it must just be that unique thing where you're not. You know, you're a caretaker, but you're also molding the future of it. But yeah. knowing mm-hmm. that you're leaving it for someone else, because no yeah. one wants to be the person that finished off Doctor Who. No, yeah. and you're always worried about that every yeah. year, because also now the thing is, like, you know, like I did three seasons. Three seasons of any other show is really rare now. You yeah. know, to get a second yeah. season these days on a drama, yeah. look at all the things that aren't getting second seasons that are great shows. Mm-hmm. To do three seasons on a show 
is extraordinary. Um, you know, I've written more Doctor Who than I've written Broadchurch. Right. And, and you know, uh, so, yeah, you were all, like, I think that's, that's a, a thing in terms of keeping up with modern television, mm -hmm. a thing of how does the show keep evolving and keep continuing it, it that's a really interesting discussion and thing and and you know and it will because now the disney thing is, is the perfect solution to mm -hmm. opening up space opening up budgets right. opening up being able to have places for spin-offs which you know we wanted to do but there wasn't the space or budgets for mm -hmm. um uh yeah so so yeah it, it's um you, yeah, of course you, of course you worry that. And I remember when I got the job, I remember reading an interview with Stephen, and the headline was, "I'm just glad I didn't kill off Doctor Who." And I was like, <laughs> "Thanks, <laughs> thanks." <laughs> and it's like, but uh, you, you know, you, yeah, you're, you're constantly thinking that, and, yeah. and it's like, and also they were really secretive about the plan coming in after us. You know, mm -hmm. going, there's a plan, there's a plan, there's a plan, and then it's like. Okay, it's like, okay, that's fine, and you know, you know, you can't be sure that they're telling right. you the truth. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, so it's it's just delightful and amazing. Mm -hmm. Just just as our chat has been, Chris, you've given us like an hour of your time today. Yes, and that well, so well, we amazing. only have to stop because I have to go and do another you, panel. I'm, I'm, you know, I'd happily talk for another couple of hours. Part you know. two coming. Uh, yeah, next right. Week. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chris Chidwell, thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, Chris Jimble. That was, uh, uh what a, what a great, I, I'm, I feel sad that we never actually spoke to him after, uh, and that Chris, no, you never met him. Chris, met him. you, <laughs> I, I even pointed no. him out, I think on the Saturday no. night or something. There he is at the bar. You could go meet him right now, but it never happened. Well, yeah. Seeing him at the bar and going and talking to him were two different things. Yeah. No. I'm Canadian. I'm polite. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> yeah. Credit <laughs> all evidence to the contrary. <laughs> well, cr credit Paul Cornell because we were Warren and I were down at the karaoke on the Thursday night mm -hmm. uh, and hanging out, and I, we saw uh, Chibnall and Paul and I think Jamie Magnus Stone and Arlen Jones and Daft Shermer were at the bar earlier in the evening. Which is okay. They're over there. We're just gonna. They're they're you know people in in the industry talking about industry stuff and we're going to bother them and then we just sort of happened to look behind and there's Cornell bringing Chibnall all around uh and he just waved us over and said okay let's go <laughs> we're going to meet Chris Chibnall now and so we met him and Paul being great it just sort of says this is you know Stephen Warren from Ready for Scarrow mm -hmm. and he goes oh Ready for Scarrow and I couldn't tell if he was like you know saying oh you know he would yeah, have said that's... anything <laughs> you know because um, that is a showbiz thing it is a showbiz thing it. but he is not showbiz Chris Chibnall is not no. You know, in in, the, in he's, the, he's not establishment. He's he's not. He doesn't. You know, he's just wearing. A he hoodie. doesn't come off as that anyway. Yeah. yeah, a hoodie and trainers. You know, just like he's not. He's yeah. He's 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 a big wheel in, in TV production, but he's he's such a fan. You know, um, he loves the color orange. Let me tell you that. He had a big orange T-shirt. I almost thought like, uh, is this like for Orange Shirt Day or something? Which is a big thing here. No, he's every but... interview I've ever seen. He's always got some sort of orange thingy on. Interesting. Never know. Speaking that. of uh, orange stuff, just a slightly divert things um right. it's not in the show notes because he posted it as a as an instagram story but uh oh somebody somebody sent shudigatwa uh photos of oh, right, some, of the, yes. some of the people cosplaying his his orange and brown outfit from yeah Galley. i believe it was and, dominic uh, martin talia franks and amanda prescott that's the one and, uh, three, uh, yeah 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 um, so he, he put that on his Instagram story and, mm -hmm. uh, of course those are, those are ephemeral. Yeah. Um, so I can't link to it, but, uh, um, oh, those are screenshotted. I'm pretty sure the people oh, in there definitely they screenshotted are. them. Yeah, they are. Um, but, uh, I like putting stuff at the source for, for links, but anyway, <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of cool to, to see that, you know, people are, have, you know, seen that stuff, sent it his way and mm -hmm. he's, he definitely seems, um, you know, appreciative and, and, and whatever of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, um, I, I I really had a good time talking to Chris Chibnall. We had a great conversation. Mm -hmm. It would have yeah. gone on, as he said at the end of the interview, we would have gone on for hours if it wasn't for, like, we went up right to like 11.52 or sort of kept an eye on it. He had a panel had, or something. I he had a panel that. to go to, and I just think, yeah. But um, he's a great fellow. Yeah. yeah. And as, as we talked about uh, at Galley, that man had a lot of panels. They really put him to work. He worked his butt off. He did. Yeah. You know, I don't, you know what? I don't even think it was work. It was just, he was just enjoying it. He was just, just in, involved in the convention. I think he's always wanted to come to the convention. Uh, it almost feels like he became Doctor Who showrunner just for, as an excuse to be invited to the convention, you know? <laughs> well, on the Thursday, he said, this is the first convention I've been to since like, like he was 16. Like 88 or something like that. Yeah. He was yeah. like, you know, super young. Um, yeah. 
just just dove right in just dove right in uh you know did not velvet rope anything throughout the whole course of the weekend it was just uh nope. all around um yeah just a delight just a delight i hope you enjoyed that interview hope you enjoyed the stuff that came out of it like the uh you know, Chris Chibnall did not destroy Christmas. Uh, it was B- <laughs> explains B- that, yeah. BBC <laughs> controllers who who who, uh, who moved Spyfall from uh, from uh, Christmas Day to, to New Year's Day, which I I thought was quite intriguing. And then also his comments it was too scary or something. Yeah, all, all his comments about uh, uh, you know about BBC marketing and budgets and stuff like this, and what he thought about the Disney Plus deal and everything about how that should have come along a lot lot earlier. I thought very interesting. It's- you know. It's kind of kind of uh, cool that he covered off some of those things, and he had, from what I understand, he had some pretty frank conversations with any number of people at the con. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people who might have expressed some negativity, and he's like, "Oh, I'm seeking seeking their feedback and things like that." But um, there's a lot of that stuff which isn't known at the time like mm-hmm. it might be rumored yeah or yep. there might be reports whatever but to actually have it discussed corroborated explained whatever is uh quite quite good because it 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 forces you to take a second look at what's gone on because i mean yeah it's one thing to say we know that covid completely messed with series 12 13 mm-hmm. rather yeah um but it's another thing to have him go into more detail about how and why and 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 uh just give the explanations of of you know how flux came about in its final form yeah well, the fact that jody had to isolate literally isolate for a year yeah. because if she didn't that show didn't happen right you don't think about that and the other thing i think that comes out of it for me is that is that nerds myself included have a tendency to go that person in front of me they must be the one in charge so they do it all the time with every fandom and here we find out not that surprise that no, there are people above these people who are actually who mm-hmm. actually do pull all the strings and make all the decisions, and you just got to go with it. Those are your bosses if you want to get the show made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, and we, working working within the confines of the BBC is going to yeah. obviously be different from you know ITV or whatever other entity because of the you know um, the, the public aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the people at the top are making decisions not just based on Doctor Who, but any multitude of things. Yeah. No, no, there's only Doctor Who. That's their only, <laughs> only, do- only review. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Everything else, screw that. It's Doctor Animated Who's Animated episodes, B- that's all they care about. Yeah, Doctor Who's BBC. Uh, it's it's not like that, you know? Everyone's, even even now, you know, Doctor Who's on Disney+, Plus, but uh, as, as you all know, Doctor Who isn't Disney+. Plus. It's uh, it's one of many things on Disney+. Plus. Well, so. and we'll see how much, how much uh, belt tight happens with Bob Iger that eh, it'll definitely be on season, but who knows? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it is it is a distribution and not an actual production, so that that's yeah, that's yeah, a good thing, I suppose. But uh, yeah, um, just fascinating. I really hope you enjoyed that, folks. Uh, that that was I, I'll be honest. I was I was hoping to my my grand plan was to like butter him up on the commentary and maybe get 15 minutes of his time uh we you know this is weeks ago uh before Gallifrey won uh I was blown away by by his accessibility and his uh, eagerness to talk about Doctor Who and everything yeah. else you know he came up to a room that's another thing. Like I was like, you know, the best place. Like, a lot of trust. Holy. Yeah, literally. I know. Like, like it was like, yeah. like it's it's kind of like, I like I I literally had I had all the microphones ready for whatever situation. I had a shotgun mic. I had a different mic. I had a I had a lapel mic. Uh, I had the zoom. Uh, but then I had set up our our nice uh, mics, uh, the the our Sure MV sevens, up in the hotel room, and the off chance that maybe he'd come there. I even took a picture of the recording setup just to say that you know to have ready. <laughs> so just so you know, the, here's our setup. Uh, it's it's probably the best option because it was kind of cold that day, so like recording it outside mm-hmm. was kind of bad. Uh, the lobby will be bad. Um, Everywhere else would be like, the best place to do it would be our room. And he says, is it okay if we go to a room? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Oh, okay. Well, I had a picture. Can I show you the picture? I did show them the picture, but. Uh, I had this same qualms when I was interviewing Rich Tally. I'm like, the easiest thing is just for me to go to your place. Are you cool with that? <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah. But I was like, ah, I feel a little weird asking this. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but not Rightly so. Yeah. But. On channel, I, I I hope he I hope he feels comfortable. And I mean, the, here's the thing: I don't know he'll if he'll ever get the this type of reaction as he did with his first uh, Gallifrey one. Um, 
but I feel like he is someone who might want to go back again and, uh, and mm-hmm. just, just experience it all again. Uh, I hope that's the case because, uh, I think he'll very much be welcomed. Um, had a good oh, time God, yeah. and, and we all had a good time, yeah. uh, talking to him. So also he was, um, um, he was doing like autographs and photo ops and things like that. And he was for photo photo ops. I think he was charging something like 25 bucks, right? which is a fraction of everyone else. He was, mm-hmm. he was not charging for autographs. Um, like one, one friend went and got his season 11 DVD set or signed or something like that by general, but yeah, not charging for autographs. Nothing. He was just, um, bucking a lot of trends that, uh, I didn't expect that he would be forcing bucking. nerds. To rethink things, which is always a good thing. Yeah, it is. I think we concoct a lot of stuff in our minds about what happened, uh, you know, and, and let's be fair. We, <laughs> we, we enjoy, we, you know, his, his era was probably not our favorite era in, in the mind. That's not, I mean, that's just because we liked the, the, the Moffat era so much yeah. uh, on this show anyway. Um, but it's seeing hit the person and hearing tales of how they made it, you know, in person. It just, it just really crystallizes. That. That's what I love about Gallifrey one. You know, it's, it's when you go to other conventions and stuff, you, you, you see the stars, they're up there, they're behind the velvet mm-hmm. ropes, they tell the anecdotes, uh, and then that's it. And you never really get a good insight about how they made the show over the past five, especially during COVID. Um, which is always going to be tough. And then when you see people like just talk about it firsthand and, and it's just, you just get such, uh, such an understanding of how everything mm-hmm. happens and why well, if something a, happens that doesn't, it doesn't quite agree with you that it wasn't out of malice. It was because of many, many outside factors. Yeah. And, and to go back to him doing panels, like, uh, like we said from Galley, he was on a, like a, he was on a, a TV production panel on a, on a writing panel. Yeah. Uh, plus all the, you know, commentaries and coming out at the end of Jody's first interview and all that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, like he's a wealth of knowledge and I, I mean, Moffat was there in 2019. He didn't do panels like that. No, no, I didn't. I don't see RTD doing it <laughs> if he ever makes it to Galley. I know. Yeah. I, 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 mean, I suppose that might depend on how, how long after his current run that might happen if it happens, but still that's, he was, <laughs> Um, it, it, he was just, yeah, um, doing a lot of stuff that, uh, the incumbent showrunner, I wouldn't normally expect them to do. No, especially this far, this close to having stopped. Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, Moffat, Moffat was very gregarious. He was in the bar every night or most every night and just chatting up with chatting with whomever, all that kind of stuff. But that's, that's a little bit different from, you know, sitting in one of the panel rooms and talking about whatever Mm -hmm. absolutely well all right um let's let's move on i guess that's uh i mean uh, we're we're like 15 minutes into this recording but we're about an hour and a half into this actual podcast because of the Mm -hmm. interview so uh nerds reassessing things this is where we could talk about the new um New season of Picard, but Steven hasn't seen them yet. I haven't seen so. him. I haven't seen him. <laughs> no. I reassess nothing until the entire season. I have seen the first two episodes, <laughs> yeah. but I wait till the end because that's when they get you. Yeah. Haven't, uh, haven't seen a single second. Just a busy catching up on stuff, uh, over the past week. So, uh, tell, tell you what, uh, we'll do the time lash last just because, uh, we can wrap it up because there's, there's been news happening over the past couple of weeks. It's a lot of it seems old, but, uh, but we sort of cherry picked some of the more timely stuff. Um, to pass along to you like th- this this happened a week ago i don't know the full story of it but but you remember eagle moss which ran the um uh the doctor who figurine magazine and they, the alas they they went into business um last year late last year, year ago it was. yeah i think about a year uh not you know i think it was l- much more recent than that but um anyway uh it looks like the the figurines maybe not the magazine and, and it's separate from eagle moss uh but sci-fi collector is relaunching the Doctor Who figurines, which is exciting. Uh, I heard, um, this is chatter. I don't know how public (laughs) public this is. So sorry if I'm throwing people out of the bus here, but, uh, I was listening to, to, on, on the Thursday night at Galley, Chris Chibnall talked to Jamie Magnus Stone about how they had a couple of figurines ready to go for this magazine when it, when it dropped. And it was, one of them was a Sontaran on a horse, uh, which is Jamie Magnus's <laughs> uh, idea. And I can't remember who the other one, it might've been Carvin Easel, which is, uh, the, the picture, uh, featured in the, um, in the article here on Dr. Who News. Uh, but, uh, so hopefully those will, we'll see the light of day now so you can get, uh, figurines of those cats. So 
I have yeah. a couple of the old Ego Moss ones, and they are very well made, like a, a War Machine and a Mandrel, I believe. Oh, oh and oh. I have a Croton as well, I believe. I've, uh, you know what? Speaking of Mandrel, I totally missed the Mandrel cosplay at Gallifrey One. And that, I did too. I didn't that know this upsets so did I. me. That upsets me because I would have one hundred percent got a photo with that. I'll tell you what I did miss though: the Drashig cosplay, which was oh, brilliant. That was my fantastic. God, yeah. yeah. God, was so and Vorg. Let's and not Vorg. do any Vorg erasure here. And Vorg. Yeah. And it's expected there was a whole bevy of um, uh, of Jody cosplayers outside at one point. Um, I think like forty or fifty. I think I was getting good food at the food uh, food truck for a second. I thought maybe Jody Whitaker was amongst them, but uh, so did I. I looked. Not. Yeah, yeah, nope. But she was not. Um, she anyway, was a delight, by the way. Oh, Jolie, yeah. You know what? Oh, she, I, she just dove in, just dove in and had fun as well. And like had this mask. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't see her with uh, it on stage, but she had this massive scarf of Doctor Who ribbon, like ribbons from mm -hmm. Galley, uh, uh, that was even longer than, than Bonnie Langford's, who had hers on, I think, for the most part, a lot of the time. But yeah, she had this and the best. Scarf. The best part of that was a couple of different friends of mine who'd made ribbons were criminologizing and found them in the picture. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, there's mine. There's mine. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. She had a good time. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Jody Whitaker was at that Calvary one, despite us just talking about Christopher this whole past hour and a half. Um, uh, what's this about now? Record store day. Record store day. 2023 is a thing that's happening in uh, April uh, 22nd. And uh, there's a 1970s Doctor Who record that'll mm -hmm. be available on Record Store Day. The headline says, travel back to 1970s Doctor Who. I'm like, I never left. <laughs> like, I'm never going to. <laughs> kind of still there, aren't we? Yeah, Doctor Who. And so the amazing world of Doctor Who, thrilling adventures in time and space is uh, on a nice, shiny, uh, reddish, orangish. Reddish orange, yeah. Reddish orange. Uh, kind of half red, half orange. Yeah. Uh, which includes a whole bunch of... Um, uh, strips and new. I think they're all newly recorded, uh, like the Sinister Sponge, the Vampires of Krellium on the Slippery Trail in the Mission, plus a new life in the vast there from the 1976 Doctor Who annual. So that's uh, that's all for Record Store Day. It was read by uh, Dan Starkey, Louise Jamison, Jeffrey Beavers. Fun if you collect vinyl stuff. There you go. Happening. Uh, I, April 23rd, Record Store Day. Um, what's up? 22nd. 22nd. Oh, 22nd, sorry. 2023. 2023. That's why 23 mm -hmm. was in my head. Yep. Um, next up, uh, this, uh, thank, thank Chris for posting this in our, on our news list. Cause I totally missed this. The, uh, uh, Dr. Who, the complete history issues 41 to 60, um, are available now for download. I, I immediately purchased it. Uh, along with the the previous two volumes, um, so that's that's cool. I saw the hard copies being sold at a um, couple couple tables in the dealer room. And I thought yeah. I don't need you anymore. I don't need that because <laughs> I would look at them longingly. It's like, oh man, I mean they're huge, they're great, but they're big, and they got to get like eighty of them, and I'm not gonna get eighty of them and and car cart them back on my carry on or anything like that. Oh so, god, no, you know. So now I got them digitally. So it's pretty good. So yeah, 41 to 60 goes all the way from uh, from Colin Baker era all the way up until the next Doctor. So um, that's pretty cool for those people that like those. And I am one of them. Um, we uh, we uh, Earlier on uh, last weekend, we talked to Matthew Jacobs and Vanessa Yule of Doctor Who Am I, which is out on Blu-ray now. Warren, you bought it on Blu-ray for I UK. I bought it on Blu-ray. Yeah. It's region I mean, I had, free though. I've seen the screener, but yeah. I figured what the hell, I might as well, even if I can't watch it, which I can, um, I still want them to get some money out of me. So I bought it for 40 bucks American, I think. Oh, wow. Right. Nice. It's coming out in um, in North America on March 28th and it's available for pre-order on iTunes here in uh, here in North America, presumably maybe like a Google or wherever else you you buy uh, you buy things digitally. I'm an iTunes person, so I don't usually look elsewhere. But um, so there you go. It's it's available for pre-order. March 28th is when it comes out. I think it's like twelve, thirteen dollars or something on iTunes. So I'm in yeah. it. I get royalties. I don't get any royalties. There's no royalties involved. I'm just a person <laughs> you haven't mentioned that before. It's, it's never come up. I know. I know. Oh God. Anyway, uh, and some a uh, couple big finish uh, stuff. Uh, big finish: the Doctor Chronicles, the Tenth Doctor, Defender of the Earth. Uh, it comes November for a change, twenty twenty three, as read by uh, Jacob Dudman and uh, narrates in it. Because uh, that's it. That's it for the Tenet ones. That's it. You had Tenet for a little while during COVID, but now he's back to being on the TV and whatnot. And uh, 
So Jacob Dubden. Until they do over. 14th Doctor once, which inevitably they will. Yeah, they might. That's cool. Oh, I don't know. Well, we'll see what happens. We'll see how long well, the got... life of... He's only got like probably three days worth. He's going to be the shortest run Doctor since Paul McGann. And, uh... Exactly. He's got three specials, so they might get right back into it the 14th. Yeah. 10th meets the 14th. I mean, that's a pretty cheap way to pull it off, but you could do it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the the once in future guest, so Big Finish is doing a, a long series of uh, of uh, releases leading up to the 60th anniversary uh, from May through October. And then with the final coda in November 2024, I'm still curious about that coda in November of 2024. Uh, just because, you know, that's such a thing. Oh yeah. By the way, we'll do a coda one year after the, the anniversary. Um, they announced the guest stars that will be in, there's everyone, everyone who's yeah, ever been in big pretty finish much anybody. is yeah. in there. The, the, the list is almost too long, but, uh, links in the show notes to, to read like, you know, folks like M- Michelle Gomez, who uh, you'll know is Missy, you know, George attendant, Michelle Ryan, Camille Cadore, Neve Manga, all those folks, all the folks are in there. So so big, uh, big celebration, anniversary celebration from Big Finish coming in with a whole bunch of guest stars. Right. Well, now, now is the time, uh, an hour and a half into this podcast that we will hmm. uh, look back in the time lash, uh, the music of which is brought to you by Quiller. Uh, I want uh, Paul... <laughs> I, I performed, I, I did, I did a thing for the Cornell Collective at Gallifrey One, playing some music in for Paul's panel. And, uh, he thanked me with a special gift, which was a 45 single of the original theme from Quiller from 1975, a show that I have yet to watch yet, but the music is, uh, Do you have a record player? struck me. I don't have a record player. No. Yeah. Which is fine. I don't need it. And then I can look at no, it. No, it's a historical <laughs> artifact. Exactly. Well, they have them now, Chris. You've got at least one mm-hmm. in your home, I think. One what? A vinyl record player. Yes. Yes, yeah. I do. You're welcome to come over and use it. <laughs> to listen to the two To minutes. listen to Quiller and then leave. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. It. All right, we're done. Get out. Oh, I got. Oh, I have my Led Zeppelin records on uh, on vinyl, too. You'll be amazed to know. <laughs> I'm sure Chris but, uh, wants you to subject his player to that. Yeah. Yes. We're going to yeah. listen to uh, not, album two of physical a, graffiti. Let's do it. Not being a Zeppelin fan, it would not be top of my list. I'm sorry. That's fine. I'll bring it over. I'll bring it over. I've got bootlegs on vinyl, all right? I got bootlegs of... Um, wow. uh, I don't have a record player. I don't know where I'd put it. Uh, yeah, I know. That's what I... I'm, I don't really listen to music that much outside of my headphones. Anyway, anyway, uh, let's look back at uh, This Week in History and Doctor Who. February 26th to March 4th is what we're doing today. Uh, the late, great Tony Selby was born on February 26th, 1938. Died this past year, sadly. But... Um, um, what else happened on February 26th? 1965. What happened, Warren? I just want to give Brian Hills a big uh, prize for persistence, because yet again, <laughs> another one of his scripts for The Dark Planet is rejected. We 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 need to do a tally of Brian Hales' scripts being rejected, even even when they were made, let's face it, because, yeah. you know, Celestial <laughs> like, wow. Toymaker is... More or less rejected. Seas of Death, more or less rejected. Monster of Peladon, more or less rejected, because Terrence Dix rewrote both of those. Um, yeah, the most <laughs> hard luck hard luck writer in Doctor Who history, Brian Hales. An idea apparently, guy, I guess. Yeah. Apparently that story was uh, rejected because it was too close to another story that was also rejected. <laughs> How does that yeah. make sense? It's quite a, sa- quite a tale we got here. That is. But, but apparently it was... Uh, as with many of these, uh, it was adapted by Big Finish in 2013 by Gallifrey One guest Matt Fitton. Ah, oh, no, Matt Fitton. Well, how about that? Everything, everything will be a Big Finish. That's that's the natural thing of life. If you have your script rejected in the 60s, it will eventually become a Big Finish play. Just mm-hmm. sit tight. You know, decades after your death, as it was with uh, Brian Hales, it'll be uh, it'll be rejected. Um, uh, debut broadcast, 1966, February 26th, of The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve, Episode 4, Bell of Doom. We are introduced to Dodo uh, at the end of that. Uh, how exciting that was for everyone to meet Dodo. I uh, Listen, I want to see that episode for many reasons. Big, that's, of course, the big speech that Hartnell gives at the end of The Massacre in the TARDIS, um, which is sort of played out in the uh, Adventure in Space and Time. But mostly I want to see it because of the ramshackle 
TARDIS they used on location because the the day they shot the location bits for Dodo's uh, entrance um, was the same day they they were recording episode eleven of the Daleks Master Plan in studio or twelve and they needed a TARDIS for that so they have the worst looking TARDIS the windows are not only the wrong size they're the wrong everything there's like uh, you know there's like a it looks like a tic tac toe board on on there and uh, I want to see what it looked like on screen but we don't have we don't even have telesnaps of it so we may never know which is a shame. when they come to animate it i hope they actually include the ramshackle looking tardis in the background of that shot just for <laughs> historical accuracy well that's uh, a lottery when it comes to animation is it going to be a sasha dewan easter egg or is it going to be screen accurate <laughs> nonsense that's true either is legitimate i'd like to point out i'm not complaining about no, either no. Screen accurate crap. That's what I want. I, I want it to look as bad as it looks in 1966. I want screen accurate crap. And I want, actually, I was talking, this is about costuming and it's a galley thing, but I was talking to a friend who's a costumer and we were talking about how screen accurate is actually nonsense. Because if you look at especially old stuff, all the screen accurate stuff was stuff that didn't look anything like it because, you know, a crappy television back in the day wouldn't show. You could have buttons oh. that didn't match anything historical. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> or because it's black and white or, yeah. Yeah. Or you could get, uh, you know, the you get a screen accurate uh, phone that Janet Fielding used in uh, during the opening scenes of Power of the Doctor, but there'd be tape all over it because, uh, as she said in the commentary, she, she she found looking at a reflection distracting while doing that scene, so they had to put tape on her phone mm -hmm. so she wouldn't see herself. So if you want a screen accurate phone from Power of the Doctor that Tegan uses, uh, put some tape on it, and that'll do it. This is, as usual, nerds fixating on the thing that's in front of them as opposed to the actual details of it. Yep, absolutely. Uh, anything else on the 26th uh, jumping out of you there, chaps, you want to talk about? You want to a mention? lot of recording. Nope. A lot of recording. A lot of recording. A lot of new series stuff being made guess, in February uh, in Wales. What a time. Let's, let's throw it out there. 1977 debut broadcast of the Talons of Wang Chiang, episode one. There we are. Talons of Wang Chiang. Problematic episode these days. I mean, yes, but still a very good story. Very good story of its time. Very, very of its time. Yeah. Anyway, on with uh, February 27th. What a shame we're not in the leap year. We can't do the 29th. Maybe we can. I don't know. I haven't clicked that, clicked that far in the link. Um, uh, anything jumping out of you on the, on the 27th that uh, you want to mention? How about, uh, hmm. how, oh, hmm. actually, I, we're, we're, we're approaching a big time here, actually, because uh, 75, we'll mention, Terry Nation is commissioned to write the Android Invasion. Yay. Yeah. That's good yeah. news. 1980, yeah. Christopher Priest, which is just a cool name, uh, is commissioned to provide a storyline for Sealed Orders. Oh, that was oh, going to be... Which sounds like a, that sounds like a Sandbaggers episode. <laughs> it kind of uh, does. Maybe it was, actually. Season, season 18... A political thriller set on Gallifrey in which the Doctor is seemingly ordered to kill Romana by the Time Lords. A complex plot involving time paradoxes would result in the appearance of a second Doctor, who dies, and lead to Romana's departure. It also involves the idea of time running into itself, resulting in one TARDIS existing inside another. So it's kind of like Legopolis yeah. meets yeah, yeah. Deadly Assassin. Mm -hmm. yep. Intriguing. I don't know if it'd be good, but intriguing for sure. Did Big Finish make that one too? And if not, why not? <laughs> yeah, I want to hear it. I want to hear this one. Yeah. Uh, it does not say that they have. Well, you're leaving money on the table right there, because that sounds very Come intriguing. on, big finish. Come yeah. on, I'm admonishing you officially right now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is a big day, though, in history. February 27th, 1985. The British press leaks the news that Doctor Who has been put on hiatus by the BBC. Doctor mm -hmm. Who axed in BBC plot, I believe the uh, the headlines screamed that day. <laughs> for once, they were right. Yeah, but it's it's not as important as two years later for Warren and his personal history, where Sylvester McCoy is announced as the seventh Doctor. Okay, I just want to point. I didn't say it at the time we were talking about showrunners. Right. Andrew Cartmel seemed like a lovely fellow. I don't. I do not like his era whatsoever. But he seemed like <laughs> an okay guy. So that follows what you were saying about. <laughs> well, <laughs> Andrew Cartmel is a self-proclaimed showrunner of the of sure. the Sylvester yeah. McCoy era. But That's the he wasn't, thing. But but you know, if you went by what I think about the era, you'd think he was a blood-drinking monster. And he most certainly <laughs> is not that. So right. <laughs> That's he's true. A very, he's a very good cat dad. So yeah. What a two years. What a two years from uh, Doctor Who acts to uh, Here's Your New Doctor, which is pretty much what the BBC wanted, I think, the whole time. Well, let's just try to kill it and then 
Have some cast whoever. Just let it fade away. That's what the BBC did to Doctor Who. Let's move on. Yeah, move on to February 28th. February 28th. uh, Mervyn Pinfield, the uh, the first associate producer of uh, Doctor Who, was born 1912. Just give you an indication. And then World War II happens. Coincidence? Oh, then the Titanic sank. The Titanic sank too. Yeah. One. Yeah. Uh, also invented the uh, teleprompter, but didn't get to the patent office in time before Thomas Edison stole it. That's I might be completing history there a little bit. but uh, <laughs> Could be Nikola Tessa. Probably not him either. Not him either. Uh, what else happened on this day? Recording for Marco Polo happened. Recording for the Space mm. Pirates. Nin- yes. 1981, debut broadcast of Legopolis, episode one. Oh. The beginning of the end for Tom Baker. Yeah. Prepared for, though. Quite mm. prepared mm-hmm. for Yep, devastating, devastating. Still remember that first the, my reaction to the f- opening shot. Just thought something, something, something bad's gonna happen here in the next hour and a half because I watched the omnibus version. It was not on February twenty eighth, nineteen eighty one, but uh, that's what was first broadcast. Uh, I tell you what, we're gonna, you know what? There is no let's, February. Let's do the 29th. Let's do yeah. the 29th. There's no 29th. There's a little bit there Not happening much. this year, but wow. uh, but but stuff actually happened. Uh, they for one. Uh, the only episode ever broadcast on February 29th happened in 1964 with uh, episode two of Marco Polo, The Singing Sands. Look at that. February 29th. The only episode ever broadcast on February 29th. Uh, I, I'm saying that because in 1984, uh, both Patrick Trout and Fraser Hine were contracted for the two doctors. This is further credence to the whatever 7B theory or whatever the, um, I can't remember. What, what's the name of the, the theory where they just kept doing adventures? 6B. 6B. 6B, thank you. That's, 6B. This adds to it because it's on a leap year, you see, so then they could have. It's it's out of time. You know what, You know what, uh, Warren, you'll, you'll uh, appreciate this. You know what happened that exact same day, February 29th, 1984? Pierre Elliott Trudeau announced that he was stepping down as uh, oh, yeah, prime minister. Exactly. In so the... did he ever actually really? No, you know what? I think that's such a such a boss move. Uh, he takes a long walk in the snow on February 28th. Uh, and still still to this day in, in Canadian politics, whenever whenever politicians sort of like, you know, uh, think about things, they still say we, we took a long walk in the snow because that's exactly what Trudeau did when he, when he decided to run in 1968 and then... Mm-hmm. When you decided to leave, and the boss move is to do it on February 29th. Two, on the, two on things the about period, that, though. You know, it's kind of tough not to take a long walk in the snow in Canada, and also, <laughs> also, um, he was good at self mythologizing. Just to be fair, and a little bit, know, and proper mythologizing too. But mm-hmm. and he went out with Kim Cattrall. He did go out with Kim Cattrall. Yep. And uh, when he and his wife were separated, uh, she was seen partying at the Rolling Stones gig in uh, the El Marcibo in. Toronto in 1977, which is a show they did because Keith Richards was busted for drug possession or something, and they did that for charity. Uh, oh, what a long, convoluted history. And then he ordered them, killed it once. Yeah, you don't think, you think <laughs> that Canada is all boring and stuff, but look at all, all this stuff that we just talked about happened in Canada, man. And, <laughs> Most of which had nothing to do with Doctor Who. Actually, and he looked, he looked like a third Doctor cosplayer when he appeared at the Grey Cup in 1971 to do the ceremonial <laughs> kickoff. <laughs> Search for Pierre Pierre Trudeau uh, uh, Grey Cup, and you see him walking down the steps in Calgary, Alberta. Everyone else is wearing white hats, and he's got this fedora on, and he's wearing a cape and a rose on his lapel. I'm thinking. To be honest, he looks more like the animated Nelvana doctor, <laughs> just to further Canadianize it. The one who looks like Egon Spengler from the real Ghostbusters. That's true. That's kind of outfit that he's wearing. Oh, it's that's in the... I'm going to get that Vort, Vort magazine, issue five or whatever it is, because the most recent one that was, I think is out now or is about to come out is goes into all that. But, uh, yeah. Sorry, Chris, I cut you off there. I was going to say, it's kind of a Tom Baker hat, but a John Pertwee uh, jacket, yeah. A little bit. Bit of a mishmash, yeah. I'm sure that's exactly what he modeled it on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What about that obscure TV show, Doctor Who? I'm going to model all my clothing choices on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it wasn't even seen in North... Well, it was seen in North America in 1965. Does that make Joe Clark Peter Davison? <laughs> I don't know. Where does John... John Turner is most certainly, uh, like, um, Paul McGann, maybe. I don't know. Uh, no, nah, he's more of a heart and a Lee. This is getting stupid. I know. Well, he was there for, like, three months is what I mean to say. I'm just thinking of the, the short-term oh, ones where I resign yeah, and enough. now you get to lead the party into sure defeat John Turner and <laughs> Kim, Kim Campbell, Campbell, our first female doctor. This is getting really dumb. Yeah, it's pretty bad. 
Sean Lyon used to work for Kim Campbell way back in the day after after she was bizarre. prime minister and uh, yeah during so the there you go there she wasn't a great prime minister but she hates Trump so she was pretty good at slagging Trump during the Trump years oh uh, yeah well that's that's what that's that's what Canadians do right um, let's move on March first happy March uh, we skipped right over Smarch once again uh, nothing really of note happened during Smarch um, just the lousy weather yeah mm. just <laughs> lousy weather which you know. Trudeau would do his walk in the snow during. Um, uh, Roger Delgado, born March 1st, 1918. How about that? Chairman of the Evil Board, yep. Yeah. Uh, and Barbara Clegg, born 1926. Is Barbara Clegg still with us? I think she's still alive. I think she's still with us. I don't know. Well, good for her if she is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wrote, she is. She wrote Enlightenment. Born 19, I had no idea she was born in 1926, man. Makes nice. 97 years old. 97 years old. Way to go, that? Barbara Clegg. Yeah. Um... What else happened? Oh, 1965, March 1st. William M's is commissioned to write Galaxy 4. Yep. It uh, turned into something different by the time they got it to screen. Animation? I have yet to watch. Oh! Sorry, William M's. Same. Well, he died. You powered through ago. it, Stephen, right? Oh, yeah, I watched it. Yeah, I watched it all yeah, in one yeah. go. Yep. You haven't yet, have you, Chris? Still in- sitting on a shelf. We are just <laughs> awful. <laughs> right by the sitting turntable. Sitting on a drive. We are just absolutely I mean a shelf. awful, awful fans. Um... Oh, let's see. Let's speaking, let's follow speaking up. Of on... Barbara, speaking of Barbara Clay, yeah. 1983, debut broadcast of Enlightenment episode one. Nice. How, I love Enlightenment. I love it too. I just watched it. Uh, <laughs> and on her birthday. I on her birthday. I just. I wonder how many times in history a writer of Doctor one. Who one has <laughs> don't don't wonder. It's one. <laughs> it's one have had their debut episode or only episode uh, bro- actually broadcast on their birthday. Wonder how many people that's happened one. to. Andrew Pixley's got a chart somewhere. It says, here we go, seven. It's not seven, but uh, we're not going to go through it. Um, uh, following up on the uh, the cancellation bit, uh, so February 27th, 1985, the BBC, uh, it's leaked to the press. And, oh, by the way, it's it's canceled. Then probably two two days of pandemonium happens, and then the BBC says, actually, uh, Doctor Who will return in September 1986, uh, and, and it'll be back to 25-minute episodes and Saturday nights mm-hmm. and everything, so... Yeah, the 18 month hiatus that, uh, you know, never to be seen again for that length of time. Nope. No, sir. <sighs> no. At least we had slip back. <laughs> Thank God for slip back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's... <laughs> the book I couldn't get past the first three pages of, yes. <laughs> Not even audio, just, just the book. Yeah. And then a, a year later, in, in true JNT style, after meeting John Nathan Turner in a lift at BBC te- Television Center, <laughs> Pip and Jane Baker are invited to develop a storyline for trial, segment three. Oh. This is kind of how Trump hired people, too, just to bring it back to that for <laughs> no reason. Oh, yeah. Rig- uh, John Nathan Turner, for all his faults, was not Donald Trump. I'll, I'll no. Rigorous vetting process that John Nathan Turner is. Cast mm. doctors based on their, you know, I mean, I love Colin Baker, but, you know, he basically auditioned by being entertaining at a wedding. Uh, and that's how we got the role. Um, they made McCoy um, audition against uh, you know other people, but but really it was, and rigged it, was, rigged it, it rigged it so yeah. that he would go up against people who were in no no way shape or form uh, ready to be Doctor Who. Yeah, met him in a lift. Met him in a lift. <laughs> and then uh, just to wrap up the first of March, twenty twenty debut broadcast of the Timeless Children. Wow. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Remember that was the last episode in this continent, anyway, that uh, was basically broadcast without the the specter of COVID hanging over us. It. Uh, my prediction is that RTD is going to uh, make a funny aside that writes it all off. That's my guess. You know what? I oh, I can't remember it now. I can't remember where it is in the script. But in in the Timeless Children, I was watching like three or four times to prep for the commentary. Um, there's a little. There's a little line from the master that sort of says, you know, or, you know, uh, you're the first or not, depending on your point of view or something. There's a little line yeah, in there okay. that we all missed. Yeah. It was kind of like, did, did he just dismiss it? Did he just dismiss, dismiss the timeless children bit, maybe? just Or just leave it open-ended yeah. or something? Huh. Don't know. I kind of hope RTD does nothing with it. He just doesn't touch it. Just lets it go. Yeah, yeah, just lets it go, and you can foment all you like one way Because, you know what? Well, the great thing is, is that uh, uh, I love how... Cavalier things are sometimes because in in the com I just keep referencing the commentary. But uh, when when Ashad comes up on screen, uh, I just I just point blank asked um, uh, Chris Chibnall. So did you put Ashad in there because you regretted killing him off? Yep. 
<laughs> just <laughs> oh, some candor in his part. Full stop. Just yep. Just put it a line. I cloned him. There we go. I want him back. So he just wrote it in, which I find absolutely I hilarious. And I'm as guilty as anybody else. But we work ourselves into a fit about how can they possibly do that with one line. That's why they're getting paid the bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if they're big or not, but they're getting paid bucks. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. Uh, March the second. Uh, for what it's worth, it's it's uh, uh, the the anniversary date that Erica and I celebrate because it's the day that she moved to Canada, uh, not our actual an, uh, anniversary, which is February fourteenth, which just happened to be the Thursday at Gallifrey One where we got married the previous year, um, because you know February fourteenth is is taken. Um, tough to get a table at a restaurant uh, on a February fourteenth if you want to go out for an anniversary dinner. March second, a little easier to do that, but. Um, uh, and in history, I will tell you this, uh, a photo call is held to present Sylvester McCoy as the seventh doctor. Well, well. Yeah. Wearing the hat. Wearing the hat that he had. But uh, and in front of a TARDIS, it said, there's a, there's a sign on the TARDIS. I can't remember what it says now. Like, open for business or newly renovated or something. And it's him and Bonnie Langford out there. <laughs> Baker but. out, I believe it says. <laughs> Baker out. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it said. Anyway, anything else uh, on March 2nd jumping out at you there? 1970, uh, because the Alexander Armstrong is apparently more or less the same age as I am, the voice right. of Mr. Smith. I'm disappointed because on the time last year, there's no picture of Mr. Smith. It's just just a blank cell where, where Mr. Smith's rope computerized bodice would be. Oh. And don't forget, he was also in The, the Doctor, The Widow, and The Wardrobe. He was. Oh, well, that's true. As the pilot. The pilot at the end, yeah. Mm. Yeah. But not the pilot in the Stephen Moffat story. The pilot. No, no. Alexander, he's famous for something else in British. Pointless. Show. Pointless. That was it. Yeah, among other things. That's point, pointless. Yeah. yeah. Pointless. Uh, all right. March 3rd. Uh, March 3rd. What happened March 3rd? Um, Davy broadcast for Frontier in Space, episode 2. That's exciting because I love Frontier in Space. And I've, 1967's <laughs> a biggie. What happened in 1967, Warren? Uh, only one of the biggest Cybermen stories ever. Still, Tomb of the Cybermen commissioned, uh, Kit Pedler commissioned to write it. Yeah. Of course, he never really wrote it. They just sort of like provided stuff and Jerry Davis would fill it in. But that's that's how they worked True. back then. But, but it's still an iconic story. Still is. Yep. Uh, and they made, uh, this is what I love about 60s Doctor Who, they commissioned to write it in March of 67 and it is broadcast in September of 67. You know, nowadays it'd be like a year and a half away from writing to to production but not in the 60s baby not in the 60s who's gonna see it maybe somebody wants <laughs> so yeah. if, are there flubs who cares <laughs> definitely i just watched the awakening uh during my um my 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 big pilgrimage the 18th pilgrimage in my life probably and? uh it was, it was fine uh, anyway, the the, the <laughs> Eric Pringle what was commissioned. Eric Pringle was commissioned to provide a storyline for it back on March third, nineteen eighty two. See, a full year and like five months before they actually shot the thing. So mm-hmm. we need some filler. Hurry up! Yeah, always like the two parters. They just felt like little bonus, you know, like a little a little extra episode. I'll tell you what, you you want you just watch that four parter on KSBS. I'll tell you what. Let's throw in another one there. That's just for you. That little two part one. It kind of felt like Yeah, but bumps then you got to watch the yeah. King's Demons. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Which it doesn't it feel like it's two parts. All right. It's grown on me over the years, but still not a favorite. I agree. It's over quick. That's the great thing about the two parters of the 80s. Just like, yeah, you know. Mm. And fan favorite Chameleon is introduced. So, I mean, That's we true. all love Chameleon. And he gets cut out of the Awakening. There's, there's a scene that got mm-hmm. left on the cutting room floor, which. Uh, it's on I the DVD. It's on the DVD. In its unprocessed form, but uh, I can't remember if it's on the Awakening DVD or if it's on the Planet of Fire DVD. It is on, on the on Awakening the because I watched it a couple of nights uh-huh. ago, so can confirm. Can confirm. Uh, Two thousand eight, March the third, because of course it's written down in his diary. Uh, Russell T Davies begins writing the next Doctor. Oh uh, yes. Yeah. Which, when you think about it, was shot in like April. So, like, it's like, wow, that's uh, that's uh, a little, a little tight there, a little Russell the Davies. Um, but you know, that's how he wrote. I'm still not the world's biggest fan of that story. It's fine. It's not terrible or anything, but it's just kind of there. Yeah, it, it kind of relies on the uh, on the hook that this could be the next Doctor, and they try to play it out as long as they possibly yeah. can. But uh, well. 
That was, that was torturous. Is, yeah. RTD is a hype man, and sometimes it works great, and sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the times it did. A little bit. When you, we don't know the context of it. You know, it, it it's more for publicity than it is for an actual story. Because if you if you knew the context of mm-hmm. oh David Tennant is leaving, and now there's a new a new episode called The Next Doctor, well this has got ooh. And, but if you're just wa- if you're binge watching on a Disney Plus later down the line, thinking oh yeah, that's not The Next Doctor at all. I prefer I prefer the Moffat method of sneaking Clara in several episodes early just to yeah. freak, out, freak us all out. That was good stuff, wasn't it? Good stuff. Although to be fair, uh, RTD did that with Rose, so. Oh, with the, uh, the stolen earth thing and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. So so I rescind my earlier comment. <laughs> <laughs> all well, right, was Mark. that good or was he just out of ideas? Oh. Why not both? Why not both? We'll find out. We'll find out in <laughs> November of 2023 when Russell D. Davies returns to Doctor Who. Oh, I'm sure he's got plenty of new ideas. Yeah. I hope so, anyway. He's got stories for years. Uh, well, let's move on. Last day, because this episode is epic length, folks. Um... March 4th, our last day of the time last this week, the debut broadcast of the Moonbase episode four. I mentioned that because that, uh, speaking of, of making stuff too, like close to the wick, that was shot a week prior, right? Uh, in, in madness, old, in utter old, madness. In Old Lime Grove. And there was audio problems because the audio talk back over the, uh, like the, the, for the director of the PA was coming through on the actual track. Eee. They did not have time to obviously reshoot the episode as as would have to be done. So they basically just over the next week just trimmed out all the bits where they didn't need the audio uh, and and to remove that and and there it was and that is basically as live as you get and and Doctor Who kept that making uh, new episodes one week before broadcast all the way up until the end of, of season four. So several more episodes, like what? It was Moonbase, the Macro Terror, Faceless Ones, Evil of the Daleks, all went out a week after they, they shot it. It's staggering to mm-hmm. think about that. Staggering. Speaking of something staggering, yeah, 2000, oh, yes. 2005. I know exactly where you're going with this. You let's, bet. Let's, let's, let's talk historical, about that. Historical. Historical. What happened that day, Chris? Rose gets leaked onto the internet by a... Uh, somebody at a was it a, a dubbing house or was it, well, who was it that was? Was it a dubbing house or a captioning house or what was it? House, yeah. Somebody's like telling me a studio post and transfer in Edmonton, Alberta. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I thought I'd throw but, that uh, in there for the three or four people who know yeah, what that is. Nice work. The, the, the CBC had their copy of Rose and uh, or uh, and it was outsourced somewhere for yeah dubbing or captioning or some such, and uh, a copy of it got leaked onto the interwebs. And uh, a young Steven Chapansky computer. learned how to torrent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I taught a young she was I was Gandalf to his Frodo in this one. <laughs> it's funny. I, for some reason, I, meant, I, I remember it as being March 5th, but maybe that is just the day that I heard about it. And it actually happened on the 4th. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it actually I happened. don't remember exactly what day it was. Yeah. yeah. I do remember watching it and going, oh, this is actually really good. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. It was good, but it was so different. I remember. I'm glad I, I'm glad I watched the leaked version. I think I have said this before on the podcast. I, I was like to be, no, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to wait to see it when it actually broadcasts. But in between the time I started the download to when it finished, I thought, no, I'm totally going to watch this. And I did. And I'm kind of glad because mm-hmm. I was so used to classic Who and how classic mm-hmm. Who is that I I was not ready for what new television would look like when it was Doctor Who, and so I, I kind of braced because like this is this is weird, this is weird and different, and I think I like it, but I'm not sure because you know it's different, uh, and I'm glad I I'm glad I had that. So by the time it actually came out, I felt a little more comfortable with where Doctor Who was going. So thanks, anonymous employee of a Canadian uh, <laughs> my, cash my house. My favorite thing about this whole thing is how the BBC couldn't understand the technical process of it being leaked. <laughs> they just thought, did they give DVDs to everybody? Like somebody who was apparently a million years old and knew nothing about computers, which wouldn't surprise me. Right. Uh, just was baffled by how this had happened. <laughs> yeah. They were asking, where's the yep. tape? Provi- give us the tape. Right. I was like, tape? What do you, what do you mean tape? What is what are you talking about? Because they just yeah. thought it's a series several, of tubes. Yeah. Yeah. Several years later, <laughs> series seven Blu-rays in the hands of customers before the <laughs> finale gets broadcast. True. Where's the tape? Good people that we were. We didn't say anything. No, we didn't. Well, I didn't have it on hand anyway. So yeah. But yeah, those who did didn't say anything. Yeah. Because Doctor Who fans are such such good folk, aren't we? Aren't we? Well, mostly. <laughs> Most of them. All right, that's it. That's it for this uh, yeah. this time lash and indeed this episode of Doctor Who: Colon Radio Free Scar. Hope you enjoyed the uh, 
Chris Chibble interview uh, next week. Uh, we're going to do what we, re- what we originally planned, because usually after Galley, we're so tired and stuff. We're just like, oh, what do we do? We put a commentary out, so we'll do that. Uh, it's the Lie of the Land uh, commentary, which Patreon supporters had uh, a little while ago, but it's going out in the main feed next week. So enjoy that, folks, uh, as we move into March of this anniversary year for Doctor Who. So until next time, I am Stephen in Edmonton. Or in Vancouver. Yeah, Chris and Edmonton. So long for now. You've been listening to Radio Free Scaro. Find us online at radiofreescaro.com. Follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Radio Free Scaro. Subscribe to us on iTunes and donate to the show at patreon.com forward slash Radio Free Scaro. Thank you.